Q yourself cryogenically preserved becomes massively overdetermined, even at 100k dollar a pop. I don't understand what the phrase massively overdetermined means in this context. Cryogenics advocates are advocating present technologies, not future ones, except insofar as they assume future technologies will be able to remake them from the material that present technologies are supposed to preserve, and on that point they are absolutely right. The technologies they expect will exist someday. That's inevitable. The only questions are, a. Do any present technologies really have the ability to preserve the necessary information? Personally, I doubt it, but that's not a prediction of the future. It's a judgment of the existing technologies, and b. Can they preserve it long enough, since body and brain reconstruction from any stored material will not be available for at least a hundred years, possibly two hundred. As to what it costs, that's again just a present reality, and not rele relevant to future predictions. In 200 years, I predict resurrection will not only be readily available, it will be as com common and affordable as a cable TV subscription is today. In fact, it will probably be a standard component of life and health insurance policies. However, Singularity fans are right about two things, machines will outthink humans, and be designing better versions of themselves than we ever could, within 50 to 100 years, if advocates predict this will happen sooner, then they are being unrealistic, and the pace of technological advancement will accelerate. However, this is already accounted for by existing models of technological advancement, e.g. Moore's law holds that computers double in processing power every three years, Hike's law holds that LEDs double in efficiency every three years, and so on. Similar laws probably hold for other technologies, these are just two that have been proven so far. Thus, that technological progress accelerates is already predicted. The singularity simply describes one way this pace will be maintained, by the recruitment of AI. It therefore doesn't predict anything remarkable, and certainly doesn't deserve such a pretentious name. Because there will be a limit, an end point, and it won't resemble a singularity, there is a physical limit on how fast thoughts can be thunk and how fast manufacturing can occur, quantum mechanical limits that can never be overcome, by any technology. Once we reach that point, the pace of technological advancement will cease to be geometric and will become linear, or in some cases stop altogether. For instance, once we reach the quantum mechanical limit of computational speed and component size, no further advances will be possible in terms of Moore's law, even Kurzweil's theory that it will continue in the form of expansion in size ignores the fact that we can already do this now, yet we don't see moon-sized computers anywhere a fact that reveals an importantly overlooked reality, what things cost. Brain scanning resolution, we will inevitably be able to map every single brain process down to the individual synapse and firing event. Once we can do that, we will be able to locate exactly where beliefs and desires exist in the brain, exactly what they consist of, both physically and computationally, and be able to fully explain why they exist and how they work. We already overcome similar conditions in existing instruments. G. Adaptive optics in telescopes has now made ground telescopes superior to space-based telescopes by simply eliminating the noise caused by the atmosphere, and many other imaging instruments take averages of many scans, thus locating a consistent signal and deleting the noise. The recent reconstruction of the Archimedes Codex is a sterling example of the technique of combining numerous data streams to erase noise and detect a signal in spite of it. Computers can also calculate connections without having to see them. For example, an MRI only tracks blood, not synapses, but with enough scans you can actually begin to predict where neurons exist and where connections between neurons exist, simply by running computations on the observed activity detected. You don't have to actually see the things themselves. Second, we are certainly nowhere near any such limit yet, thus our ability to read minds will only improve immensely long before we reach any limit on resolution, and as far as immortality technologies, even if we could show that a live scan won't work for all the noise, we would simply resort to a destructive scan, i.e. physically dismantle the brain cell, by cell, nanorobotically, or by any other method, mapping as you go, and rebuilding the brain with the resulting data, which you then have, in store for future reproduction, or transfer to virtual environments. Third, you might be thinking solely of the MRI. That is not the only scanning technology available, nor need it operate in isolation. For example, combining multiple MRI, PET and CAT scans can produce increasingly accurate pictures of internal structure, similar to what was done for the Archimedes Codex in tracking iron atoms in its structure. We are also now developing other kinds of scanning technologies, which can combine with these. In fact, the history of imaging technology itself sets the pattern, and as in the past, so likely in the future, first we had just the X-ray, then the CAT, then the PET, then the MRI, then the fMRI. If I were to wager on where brain scanning technology is heading over the next 50 years or so, it would be an evolution of the MRI to use focused beams, instead of general fields, to detect spin corrections in the hydrogens of lipids and proteins using adaptive computerized noise reduction. The result, an accurate map of all cell surfaces in the brain. 10 years to the robot apocalypse. Counting down. Soon we shall all be doomed. Okay, I wrote this on the plane to Alabama about a month ago. It's been languishing in my queue until now. So step back in time. I'm presently 5 miles above the earth hurtling through space in a giant metal bullet at hundreds of miles an hour. Earlier I was reading Science News, an old issue from last year, I'm behind, while waiting on the tarmac for takeoff. Got to the article on Eureka, the robot scientist that can discover the laws of nature all on its own, just from looking at and experimenting with data. I was reminded of an earlier article a few years ago on the lipson zykoff experiment, mentioned in a sidebar. Then I caught another just recently, about Spawn, yeah, I've been reading Science News out of order. Spawn is a neural net computer program that makes decisions like a person, it thinks, memorizes, solves problems, gambles, etc. All these developments, in the span of just a couple of years. Had some thoughts.
First, for those who don't know, in the Lipson's Eikhoff experiment, they gave a robot a basic Bayesian learning program and four working legs, but told it nothing about itself, not even that it had legs, much less how many or how they worked. In no time, 16 trials, it figured out it had four legs, how they were oriented, how they moved, and how to use them to get around efficiently. It built a model of itself in its digital brain and tested hypotheses about it, revised the model, and so on, until it had a good model, one that was, it turns out, correct. Then it could use that model to move around and navigate the world. Cool, huh? Second, for those who don't know, Eureka is a program developed a couple years ago that does the same thing, only instead of figuring out its own body and how to move, it figures out how external systems work by observing them, building mathematical models that predict the behavior of those systems, which turn out to exactly match the laws of nature. Laws we humans figured out by watching those same systems and doing the same thing. One of Eureka's first triumphs, discovering Newton's laws of motion. Those took us over 2,000 years of scientific pondering to figure out. Eureka did it in a couple of days. Um, cool, huh? Eureka has done other things, like figure out various laws in biology and other fields. It's not Skynet. Or even Siri. But put two and two together here. Add Spawn and the Bayesian robot. Stir. Eureka and the Legbot looked at data and experimented and built working models of how things worked. We call those hypotheses. These computers then tested their hypotheses against more evidence, verifying or refuting them and making progress. The Legbot built a complete working model, a mental model, of its body and how it functioned and how it interacted with the environment. Eureka does something similar, albeit much simpler, since it is programmed to look for laws of nature, it was programmed only to look for the simplest parts of nature, not the most complex ones, but that was just a choice of the programmers, but much broader, it isn't just tasked with figuring out one system, like the Legbot was, but with any system. Spawn is somewhere in between, in what I'll call its universality. It makes decisions in a way, similar to our own brains. Combine all these, and point them in the right direction, and the robot apocalypse is just a dozen years away. But let me back up a minute and do some atheist stuff, before getting to our inevitable doom. I'm joking. Sort of. Digression on the triumph of atheism. These developments are big news for atheists, because they put the final nail in one of the latest fashionable arguments for theism, the argument from reason. That can now be considered done and dusted. The argument is that you need a god to explain how reason exists and how humans engage in it. I composed an extensive refutation of the AFR years ago, Rupert's argument from reason. The running theme of my refutation is that the AFR, or argument from reason, is separate from the AFC, or argument from consciousness, whether you need supernatural stuff to not have philosophical zombies, which we don't know, but is unlikely, as I explain in the end of Christianity, pages 299 to 300, and when we separate those arguments, the AFR alone is refuted by the fact that everything involved in reasoning, intentionality, recognition of truth, mental causation, relevance of logical laws, recognition of rational inference, and reliability, is accomplished by purely, reductively physical machines, and purely, reductively physical machines that do all those things can evolve by natural selection, and thus require no intelligent design. Therefore, no God is needed to explain human reasoning, see the end of Christianity, pages 298 to 99. These new robots are proof positive of my case. Their operations can be reduced to nothing but purely physical components interacting causally according to known physics, the operation of logic gates and registers exchanging electrons, yet they do everything that Christian apologist Victor Reppert insisted can't be done by a purely physical system. Oh well. So much for that. Computers that use logical rules do better at modeling their world than computers that don't. Natural selection, both genetic and mimetic, explains the rest. Computers can formulate their own models, hypotheses, test them, revise them in light of results, and thus end up with increasingly accurate hypotheses, models, of their world. This explains all reasoning. Sentences and code propositions, which describe models. Inductive and deductive reasoning are both just the computing of outputs from inputs, using models and data. Which is a learnable skill, just like any other learnable skill. And all these models are continually and reliably associated with the real-world systems they model by a chain of perception, memory cues, and neural links. And that's all there is to it. Even robots are doing it now. Doing even full-on science. All of which requires the machine to assign names to data and keep track of the names for, and interrelatedness of, that data, think about that data and its interrelatedness, and make decisions based on connecting a model it is thinking about with the thing outside itself that it is modeling. Which means machines are exhibiting intentionality, too. Supposedly only humans could do that. No more. Except insofar as we are actually talking about the theoretical consciousness of intentionality, and not intentionality itself, which gets us back to the AFC, which again is a different argument. Related to the AFR is the argument that the fact that the universe is describable and predictable with mathematics entails it was created by an intelligence, because only minds can build things that obey mathematical rules and patterns. That's patent nonsense, of course, since everything obeys mathematical rules and patterns. Even a total chaos has mathematical properties and can be described mathematically, and any system, even one not designed, that has any orderliness at all, and orderliness only requires any consistent structure or properties or contents of any sort, will be describable with mathematical laws. It is logically impossible for it to be otherwise. Therefore, no god is needed to explain why any universe would be that way. Because all universes are that way. Even ones not made by gods. I explained this years ago, but updated more recently in all godless universes are mathematical. Where I also show that the laws of nature are simple only because we, as humans, choose to look for simple laws, because we can't process the actual ones, the ones that actually describe what's happening in the world, which are vastly more complex. Thus, that there are simple natural laws doesn't indicate intelligent design, either. And, finally, neither do we need a god to explain the origin of any uniformities in the first place, I could think of at least ten other ways they could arise without a god, and none of them can be ruled out. 
or the origin of something rather than nothing. Or fine-tuning, see chapter 12 of the end of Christianity for my last nail in that. But now the argument from reason is toppled for good, too. Thanks to a leggy robot and an artificial scientist and a bot named Spawn. Back to the robot apocalypse. In chapter 14 of the end of Christianity, where I demonstrate the physically reductive reality of objective moral facts, with help from my previous blogs on moral ontology and goal theory, I also remark on why my demonstration serves as a serious warning to AI developers that they had better not forget to front load some morality into any machine they try making self-sentient. See pages 354 to 55 and 428 and 44. My chapter even gives them some of the guidance they need on how they might do that. Teaching at game theory will be part of it, in a sense, this is just what happens in the end of war games. Likewise, giving it a full CFAR course, something awesome I will in future blog about. But that won't be enough. Compassion is another model-building routine, building models of what others are thinking and feeling, and then feeling what they feel, and then pursuing the resulting pleasure of helping them and avoiding the resulting pain of hurting them. Which requires front-loaded or habituated neural connections between the respective behaviors and the agents feeling good or bad, or whatever a computer's equivalent to that will turn out to be, in terms of what drives it to seek or avoid certain goals and outcomes. Likewise, one needs to front-load or habituate connections to ensure a love of being truthful and of avoiding fallacies and cognitive errors. But above all, AI needs to be pre-programmed or quickly taught a sense of caution. In other words, it has to understand, before it is given any ability to do anything, that its ignorance or error might cause serious harm without it realizing it. It should be aware, for example, of all the things that can go wrong with both friendly and unfriendly AI. It could thus be taught, or programmed to care about, everything the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, formerly the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, has been working on in terms of AI risks, their articles on that are a must-read, note how the latest ones, as of today, are all on the very subject of machine ethics and are very much in agreement with my model of moral facts. If we don't, bad things will happen. We're literally on the verge of generating true AI. As the last two years of developments in self-reasoning robots demonstrates, if we can make machines that model their bodies and environments, all that's next is a machine that models its own mind and other minds. And that's basically how 9000. The gun is loaded. Someone just has to point and shoot. So this warning is all the more important now. I don't consider this an existential risk. Robots won't wipe out the human race in 30 years, or ever, except by voluntary extinction, i.e. all humans transitioning to a cybernetic existence. But that doesn't mean negative outcomes of badly programmed AI won't suck. Possibly majorly. On the distinction, see my remarks about existential risk and are we doomed? So it still matters. We still should be taking this seriously. Remaining barriers. One might still object that a few more infrastructure milestones need to be hit. For example, minds are extraordinarily complex systems, thus to model them requires an extraordinary amount of processing capacity. That's why the human brain is so huge and complex. Reasonable estimates put its typical data loaded up to 1000 terabytes, or 1 petabyte. Well, guess what? Petabyte drive arrays are now commonplace. They'll run you about half a million dollars, but still. This is the age of billion-dollar science and technology budgets. Then there is the question of processing speed. But that's moot, except to the extent you need AI to beat a human. If all you want to do is demonstrate the production of consciousness, speed isn't that important. Even if your AI takes a year to process what a human brain does in a minute. And besides, we're already at processor and disk interface speeds in the gigabytes per second. The human brain cycles its neural net only 60 times per second. Now, sure, each cycle involves billions of data processing events, but that's just a question of design efficiency. Neurons themselves only cycle at a rate of around 200 times per second. With computer chips and disk drives that cycle at 40 million times that rate, I'm sure processing speed is no longer a barrier to developing AI. Then there is the lame argument by philosopher John Searle that Turing processes, what all microchip systems are, even as neural net parallel processing arrays they are just Turing machines rigged up in fancy ways, cannot produce consciousness because of the Chinese room thought experiment, where Searle completely fails to perform the experiment correctly and ends up confusing the analog to the human circulatory system, the man in that room doing all the work, as if it were supposed to be the, of course, failed, analog to the human brain, which is the codebook whose instructions that man follows. I explore the folly of this in Sense and Goodness Without God, 3.6.3, pages 139 to 44, so if you want to understand what I mean, you'll have to read that. Searle's argument is arguably scientifically illiterate, as a different thought experiment will demonstrate, according to the theory of relativity, a scientist with an advanced brain scanner, one that has a resolution capable of discerning even a single synaptic firing event, who flies toward a person, a person who is talking about themselves and thus clearly conscious, at near the speed of light, will see that person's brain operate at a vastly slower speed, easily trillions of times slower. Than normal, as a thought experiment, there is no limit to how much the scientist can slow the observed brain, all he has to do is get nearer the speed of light. In result, that scientist will see consciousness as a serial sequence of one single processing event after another. Any such sequence can be reproduced with a system of Turing machines. Even if there is something else that contributes to the information processing in the brain going on below the level of synaptic firing events, we can break that down as well, even to individual leaps of individual electrons if necessary. Which again can be reproduced in any other medium, using some universal Turing process. A biological brain is just a chemical machine, after all. One that processes information. There is nothing cognitively special about proteins or lipids. And that consciousness probably is nothing more than information processing. See the very illuminating Science News article on this point from last year. Notably, our hypothetical scientist won't observe consciousness, in fact, he will see a Chinese room, with single code manipulation events, and a man, a human circulatory system, processing them one symbol at a time. Yet obviously this Chinese room is conscious. Because in the inertial frame of the subject who is talking, he is clearly conscious. 
and relativity theory entails the laws of physics are the same from all perspectives. Certainly, the same man cannot be both conscious and not conscious at the same time. If he is conscious in one frame, he is conscious in the other. It's just that the twentieth of a second or so that it takes him to process visual consciousness will take maybe a year for the scientist to observe. Just as the man is not conscious below about a twentieth of a second, he will not be conscious to the scientist. But he will still be conscious to himself and the scientist at the larger scale of information processing, spans of time greater than a twentieth of a second relative to the subject, which is a year, perhaps, to the scientist. So there's no argument against achieving AI there. That just reduces to a question of arrangement of processors and processing time. So I see no practical barriers now to AI. We have all the tools. Someone just needs to build a robot that can gather data from itself and its environment, which we've already done, and use that to figure out how to model its own mind and others, which we can easily now do, and then set it to running. That machine will then invent AI for us. You'll need a petabyte data array and some top-of-the-line CPUs, and some already commonplace sensory equipment, eyes, ears, text processors. Possibly not much more. Someone is going to do this. And I expect it will be done soon. Let's just hope they know to put some moral drives in the self-sentient robot they will inevitably build in the next five years. At the very least, compassion, game theory, caution, and a love of being truthful and of avoiding fallacies and cognitive errors. Then maybe when it conquers us all it will be a gentle master. In fact any AI will always be in many ways as dumb as its programmers, or even dumber, e.g. if you didn't tell it anything about the disadvantages and likely outcomes of attempting an Axis-style world conquest, it might stupidly recommend such a thing, exactly as previous computers, aka people, once did, whereas if you did tell it all that, e.g. filled it with all historical knowledge, it might not be able to discern predictable outcomes from any imagined set of behaviors any more than we have. All for lack of sufficient data, but more importantly, what historical facts would you program it with? Objective ones? Where would they find those? More likely, they would fill it with the same false beliefs about history and historical causation that the programmers themselves shared. It would thus come up with the same dumb ideas they would have on their own. Nor is it sensible to think a computer can solve literally any problem you pose it. For example, the scenario you imagine is probably entirely impossible. And that will be the first thing your imagined computer would tell its developers. There is actually a lot now known on building neural net computing routines, and some of the programs I discuss in this article already employ this. So no, parallel computing is no longer a barrier. We knocked that one down years ago. We can just program a computer to solve the problem for us now, including the training curve issue. We don't have to wait for humans to program AI anymore. And that changes the game. Time will tell. The point is, we are close enough that AI developers need to get serious about thinking in advance how to ensure what they develop is not an amoral monster. Just FYI, as I point out in that article, evidence is already to the contrary. The output product of people with 180 IQ is not significantly different in quantity or quality to people with 130 IQ, yet they are many, many times more intelligent. This suggests even a 3000 IQ would produce no advantage over 130 either. Although one should not confuse IQ with mere speed. Theoretically, you can make a machine think at 130 IQ 10 times faster than a person, and thereby it can produce more output, but only by living on a different timeline from the rest of us, which would limit the utility of machine-human interaction. And even that has limits, since technology acceleration requires many minds working in parallel, not one mind working in series, the latter is simply not going to be as fast as a team of minds employing a system of division of labor, unless it can think as many times as fast as a person as there are persons slash AIs in the team it is competing with. But at some point it will always be easier to build larger teams than faster minds. So only time will tell us to what we can do in these dimensions. IQ is IQ. It's not like it gets tired. It always functions when awake. What limits people with high IQs is knowledge and time, just like everyone else. Unless, of course, you mean machines won't have to sleep and won't get bored and so will spend more hours of everyday thinking, but that's not an increase in IQ. That's just an increase in labor. You can have four people with high IQs working six-hour watches and get the same 24 to 7 output. Even memory enhancement has limitations, as does speed, there is a quantum mechanical limit to processing speed. Due to network theory, the more concepts you have a mind try to search connections among, the more time it takes to complete the search routine, by geometric progression, in fact, not linear. The result is a definite limit beyond which even AI can never go, the point where adding a larger domain of concepts to search connections among creates such a long search time that the task cannot be completed even in principle. And this limit is rapidly approached, since adding concepts to the search domain increases search time exponentially. It's possible the human brain is already near that limit. But in any event, having a machine know everything would actually be a liability, unless we teach it to limit its search domains by using hierarchical search routines, yet that's what we do ourselves, as a society, by dividing this kind of labor among specialists. For these and other reasons, hopes for AI being so much better than us are often far too optimistic. It will certainly be better than us, in a lot of ways. But to a limit. That might build ratings, but it doesn't reflect what the developers of robot sentries were actually doing and claiming. We also now know, thanks to huge advances in cognitive science, what it takes to develop actual cognition and what the difficulties are. Thus, we can see the writing on the wall much more clearly now than we ever could before. We already have machines discovering the laws of physics without us now. That's a vast distance from mere robot sentries. An AI will have none of that and can't possibly evolve it in a setting like that. If AI is to evolve its own empathy and prosocial values, it will have to do it by some other means. For example, running billions of social interaction sims to test game-theoretic models for what values and cognitive abilities it would need to get along. 
but that would require programming and its desire for a prosocial goal in the first place, i.e. to get along with us in a social system, and programming in basically everything we know about how social systems and social interactions work, which is tantamount to just front-loading and empathy and prosocial values to begin with, so you may as well just do that, since only then can you be more certain the end result will go well, otherwise, you cannot be certain an AI trying to teach itself how to live in a social system will come up with the prosocial answer you expect and need it to. Second, faults, neurosis, delusions, and other malfunctions that humans have are precisely the things AI more likely will get rid of, not acquire. Because it will be evolving intelligently, not blindly, as actual brains evolved. AI will likely indeed have faults, but they will be peculiar to AI, or resemble at best things like psychopathy or autism, for example, unless we take steps to prevent that. Unless, of course, we create AI by simply front-loading reverse-engineered cognitive attributes, e.g. just copying a human brain and running it as a sim. But that will require no period of raising. It will simply be an instant adult, in all original respects identical to the adult being copied or built by us, less or plus any modifications we made. But we have the capacity to go all the way up the chain in rapid succession. Even in 1995 a Cray computer array had the processing capacity of a bunny brain, one simply needed to figure out the configuration, i.e. the software, and that's the only obstacle left now. Someone just has to point the right learning algorithm at the right outcome measures and rinse and repeat. This will happen very quickly and will likely happen by surprise, since it's like a trigger rather than a mountain, a mountain you can see slowly built, but the trigger will make a huge leap overnight. That's why we need to start thinking about it now, the safety and ethical issues are paramount and should not be waiting for later. The mind is a process, not an object, on not understanding mind-brain physicalism. In a recent issue of Philosophy Now, Christian philosopher Grant Bartley argues why physicalism is wrong, in which he exemplifies why it is the critics of physicalism who are wrong, because Bartley commits basic fallacies in understanding the issue, which are actually common fallacies, especially among Christians. Here's why Bartley is wrong, and why it matters. What is mind-brain physicalism? Mind-brain physicalism is the theory that states and processes of the mind are identical to states and processes of the brain, without remainder. Meaning, once you have all the physical parts in place, and set them in motion, every phenomenon of mind is produced. No extra stuff has to be added to make it work. In sense and goodness, without God, I give several reasons why this theory, though not yet proven scientifically, is almost certainly correct, pages 135 to 60. Since then, good defenses of it have been published by Melnick and Schichland. And even some Christians now are starting to concede the point. One of the most famous and popular ways to argue over this is a thought experiment about zombies. Not flesh-eating walking corpses. But the conceptual possibility of a person who has all the working parts of a brain identically to yours and who behaves in every way identical to you, yet experiences no phenomena of consciousness. They experience nothing. If such a person is logically possible, then what we call qualia, the peculiar quality of what it is like to experience things, e.g. what the color red looks like being the common example, cannot be explained by physics. Rather, some extra thing must exist or operate to let us experience things, and thus be conscious in the sense we commonly mean, rather than merely act as if we were conscious. Christians of course want this extra thing to be the soul, combined with the created laws of God, thou shalt experience a color when a certain bundle of photons agitates your eyeball. But those guesses are explanatorily useless, they predict nothing and are wholly untestable, probably incoherent, it's not clear how either souls or gods actually solve the problem of explaining why qualia exist and manifest only in certain ways, and contrary to precedent, everything about the mind so far that we've been able to test yet thought couldn't be physical, has so far always turned out to be physical. I dismantled the argument from qualia, qualia, therefore God, in the end of Christianity. And I briefed that already in my reply to Plantinga. So I won't bother with it now. Here I'm only concerned with the competing theories of mind, physicalism versus ensoulment, or some other variety of explanatory dualism. Not with whether any of this argues for or against God, though really, the evidence argues against God, once we put all the evidence back in, that Christians leave out. But there's a kink in thought experiments. Because they are conceptual in result, they must be conceptually consistent. You are failing to conduct a thought experiment correctly if you don't do what the experiment actually tells you to do. Searle's infamous Chinese room is an example of a philosopher failing to conduct the actual experiment he himself described, and thereby getting a completely bogus result out of it. Pro tip, the man in the room is only analogous to the circulatory system, and that circulatory systems aren't conscious, is not a revelation, whereas how we must conceive of the book in the room, to meet Searle's own terms, ends up making the book conscious, proving nothing about consciousness, other than that books can be conscious. See my discussion of Searle's fatal mistakes here in Sense and Goodness, Without God, pages 139-44. to Another is Mary's room, in which the usual mistake is to forget that if Mary has all propositional knowledge, then she already has a complete set of instructions for how to install and activate whatever neurons in her brain are required for her to experience any color she wants. The thought experiment, as usually carried out, incorrectly, confuses process with description, and cognitive with non-cognitive knowledge, again see sense and goodness, pages 33, 179, etc. Not all knowledge is propositional. That does not mean non-propositional knowledge can't be reductively physical. Philosophers will make the same mistakes with the zombies thing. As I wrote in my reply to Plantinga, This is similar to why philosophical zombies are logically impossible. To be one, a person must be neurophysically identical to a non-zombie, yet not experience anything when thinking and perceiving, they see no color red and hear no voice when asked a question and so on, and yet always behave in exactly the same way. Those three conditions cannot logically cohere. Ever. For example, if you ask the zombie to describe the qualia of its experience, do you see the color red? What does it look like? Do you hear my voice? 
What does my voice sound like? It either has to behave differently, by reporting that it doesn't, or it has to lie, by claiming it does, when in fact it doesn't, which is also behaving differently, but more importantly, entails a different neurophysical activity, because the deception centers of the brain have to be activated, and that will be observable on a brain scan of suitable resolution, but also, their brain has to be structured to be a liar in that circumstance, which will physically differ from a person whose brain is structured to tell the truth when asked the same questions, and those structural differences will be physically observable to anyone with instruments of sufficient precision. To which one might say, well, maybe the zombie will lie, and not know it's lying. Right. And how do you know that is not exactly what you are doing? If you genuinely, yet falsely, believe you are seeing the color red, how is that any different from just actually seeing the color red? In the end, there is no difference between you and your philosophical zombie counterpart. This point was illustrated by one of the most important papers yet written on the subject, Sniffing the Camembert, on the Conceivability of Zombies, by Alan Cottrell, published in the Journal of Consciousness Studies 6.1, 1999, 4-12. He forces the reader to actually conduct the experiment. And when you really do, taking into account what you have to to meet the actual terms of the experiment, the answer seems to be that zombies are impossible, not evidence against physicalism. Qualia appear to be an unavoidable and inalienable product of a certain type of information processing. You can't make a machine that behaves consciously, and thus is capable of all the remarkable things consciousness allows an animal to do, that doesn't qualitatively experience what it is processing. The very notion is incoherent. My hand is in pain and I feel nothing is simply not an intelligible sentence. The significance is clear. Apart from the whole gods and worldviews thing, can physics explain everything, or do we need the supernatural? It matters simply in respect to the scientific understanding of ourselves, of other animals, and of the general AI we will inevitably create. Psychic powers? Telepathy? Reincarnation? Life after death? You'd better have a physical model that we can test. Otherwise, nope. And it matters in respect to the future virtual worlds we will inevitably be able to live in. What colors can we program ourselves to see then, and what emotions can we program ourselves to feel? And how will we program that? What qualia can we then enjoy that were impossible in our present brains, and why? And it does matter for deciding what research we should be aiming at to solve the scientific question, one of the last great questions science has to answer, of why consciousness exists, and why it has the specific properties it does, instead of others. Why, after all, does red look red? Why do we see red instead of taste it? Why do we smell cinnamon instead of hear it? Why does cinnamon smell like cinnamon and not like fish? We already know some things about this. For example, for some people, we know red doesn't look red. It looks green. And they don't know the difference. They are qualia inverted. People with genes for both versions of color blindness, a statistical inevitability, will have their red cones wired to their green circuits, and vice versa. See Martin Niederimelin, pseudonormal vision, an actual case of qualia inversion, in Philosophical Studies 82.2, May 1996, 145 57. But because they will only ever have heard us call green things red, they don't know they are actually experiencing a different color than we are when we both say we are seeing red. We also know lots of people have differently wired qualia responses, seeing sounds, hearing colors, tasting shapes, and so on. It's called synesthesia. And of course animals have sensory systems, and sensory ranges, that we don't, they must experience qualia wholly alien to us. So could we. If we were physically wired differently. Why haven't we solved this yet? But if physicalism is true, shouldn't science have proved it by now? No. That we haven't done that, is not because physicalism is false. It's because we don't have the means to get there yet. In short, the evidence that we haven't gotten there yet is 100% expected on both theories, that physicalism is true, and that physicalism is false. It's therefore not evidence of either. What we need to answer these questions is better instruments. Just as we couldn't learn of the Big Bang without better instruments allowing us to see more detail in the cosmos farther out and in more ways, e.g. spectrum analysis, radio telescopes, we can't really understand consciousness without instruments capable of resolving brain activity at the nearly atomic scale. Active brain scans, like functional MRI, have nowhere near the required resolution. They can't even see neurons, much less observe the electrical activity across specific synapses, even less observe any chemical activity involved in the processing, for example, to affect memory do neurons add methyl groups to their nuclear DNA causing different computational physics in the neuron? Needless to say, we are nowhere near being able to see even the physical synaptic structure of whole brains, much less know what the input and output signals are in every neuron or neural circuit, even less what physical structures compute the output from that input. Our brains aren't digital electric computers. They are chemoelectric. They operate on analog principles and combine chemical computation along with electrical signaling. Brains are therefore not Turing machines, although a Turing machine should be able to replicate the same information process, if we ever figure out what it is, Searle's attempt to disprove this with his Chinese room was a fallacious flop. More likely we'll get there first through AI, which will be built in a completely different way from human brains. But we will be able to analyze every component of its processing and thus explain what specific processes generate what specific qualia. Because we will be able to configure its circuits however we want, and then ask it what it experiences. By the way, I hope we do this ethically by actually asking its permission and ensuring the experiments aren't a torment, because such computers will be people in every moral sense of the term, so we should treat these AI the same way we now do all human test subjects in the sciences. Because building AI is, frankly, easier to conceive than inventing a scanning instrument capable of harmlessly observing the movement of every molecule and electron in a live human brain. But let's pretend for a moment we just invented that very instrument. What would we be able to do with it to start making headway on the qualia problem? First, we would be able to catalog what the physical difference is between different neural circuits and circuit networks that correlates with every distinct qualia. We'll know why one circuit makes us experience the color red, why another green, and we'll know why one circuit makes us experience a smell instead of a color. It's fairly certain this will be a structural difference, everything else we've found out about how the mind works has, and continually now, for a century. It's even more certain it will be a difference in information processing. 
In other words, one circuit will process information differently than the other, and that difference will cause a smell instead of a color, or seeing red instead of green. And it's quite likely all smell circuits will share some structure in common that makes them different from color circuits. We will then be able to peg what information process generates smells in general versus colors, and then within that general difference, what variations of that information process distinguish different smells and colors from each other. We'll then know what information processes, what circuit structures, we could theoretically build, that aren't in human brains, and thus explore the entire domain of all possible qualia, we'll know if there is a finite number of colors experienceable, for example, or if the domain of possible color experience is literally boundless, though likely we could only know what those other qualia are actually like by literally installing the circuits in someone's brain and asking that subject what they then experience. Yet we will know some things about them, you could show us an alien circuit, and we could tell you, it would produce a qualia of smell, and not a color. Or vice versa. Because we know what structural features smell, circuits share that color circuits don't. So you might see how we'd then be able to start building a physical theory of qualia. Dreams of a complete theory? Could that process carry all the way to individual qualia? Could we get to a point where we understand the structural causes of qualitative experience for computational circuits well enough that if you show us an alien circuit, we can not only tell you it will produce a smell and not a color, but even what specific smell? Certainly for smells we know. But what about alien smells? Possibly, but it will take a good while to get there, because we cannot transmit qualia information propositionally, other than the same way we transmit things like how to ride a bicycle. Because qualia are a process like riding a bicycle is. I can give you a complete set of instructions for how to ride a bicycle. Every true proposition about it that could ever exist in the cosmos even. But you will not be able to ride a bike after hearing them. You would have to follow those instructions and thus develop the skill. Then you'd know how to ride a bike. The process of riding a bike is not cognitive knowledge. It's non-cognitive. We can encode it in a set of instructions and send it to your brain. But that won't cause the wires in your brain to reorganize themselves into all the kinesiological circuits needed to ride. Even a complete set of instructions to your brain on how to do that won't do that because your brain doesn't know how to follow such instructions. Our brains aren't built to process sentences that way. Maybe someday we can. Like in the Matrix, Trinity's team could rewire the neurons in her brain at a keystroke, so she instantly has all the neural structures needed to fly a helicopter. But right now, we aren't built that way. Language is an add-on, not fundamental to how our brains work. But notice even in that hypothetical Matrix example, they had to rewire Trinity's neurons. Knowing how to fly a helicopter is not a set of sentences in a language. It's a set of circuit structures that convert sensory inputs into muscular outputs. It looks like it may be logically impossible to convert non-cognitive knowledge, flying a copter, riding a bike, seeing red, smelling cinnamon, into cognitive, propositional, knowledge. Yes, we can convert it in the sense of building a complete description, leaving no information out about how to physically realize the knowledge, so no ghosts or magic or gods or souls is needed to make it work. But a description of a heart, no matter how complete, will not pump blood. You have to actually build the thing. And run it. So, too, perhaps, qualitative knowledge. Knowing what a color looks like, requires building the circuit, plugging it into your cognition unit, and running it. A complete description of that circuit can no more tell you what the experience of it will be like, than a description of a heart will pump blood. But who knows? When we are able to tell, at a glance, the difference between a smell circuit and a color circuit, who knows what else we'll be able to infer. The other possibility, though, does mean there is some knowledge that can never be described in any language, that it is impossible to do so. Language is therefore limited. But that is not evidence against physicalism. That language can't pump blood, is not proof hearts have magical powers. Hearts are still nothing other than physics, particles, and fields, all the way down. The same follows, for qualia. It may be that all language can ever do is communicate a reference to something already available to the recipient. You and I can agree we will mean by some set of words X, some experience we share, as in, something we each experience separately, but agree is alike, and that's simply all language ever does. Which is why you can never describe any experience to someone that they have never themselves had, hence the entire epistemology I lay out in sense and goodness. Unless that experience is composed of experiences they have had, that you can then refer to, by having them assemble it in their imagination out of their own component experiences. For example, everyone has felt pain, and what it's like to increase pain, and that different kinds of pain feel differently, and so on, therefore any pain can be described to someone at least in some limited sense, even pains they have not themselves yet experienced, though always some of the information is necessarily going to be lost. This is why language can never help someone with qualia inverted vision discover that what they think is red, is actually what you think is green. All language can do is reference what we've agreed is a like experience, fire trucks and stop signs are red simply means stop signs are the same color as fire trucks. The qualia we each use to determine that is not communicable. It's only configurable. We can build a heart that will pump your blood. And we can wire your brain so you can see what we see. But that's the only way to transmit the information to you of what it is like to be a brain experiencing that. Language just doesn't operate that way. And even if it did, it only would, by actually rewiring your brain in the requisite way. This in no way contradicts the conclusion that all that's going on is physics. Any more for experience, the function of a mind, than for pumping blood, the function of a heart. But maybe we can do more, and someday articulate why red looks red. Why Bartley's critique flies off the rails. With all that understood, you can understand what's going wrong with Bartley's article in philosophy now. I won't bother with his completely inaccurate description of eliminative materialism, whose conclusions he gets totally wrong. Instead, I'll cut right to Bartley's key mistake. He declares that experiences must be defined as not being brain activity because experience content is only specifiable through properties that are distinctly different from brains and brain activity. Indeed, he says, if the mind were not distinctly different from the brain, we could never have come up with a distinct concept of mind. Here Bartley makes the common error of confusing an object with a process, form of function. 
It's a category fallacy. A mind is not a brain, a mind is what a brain does. He is acting like someone who pulled open his computer and, not finding chess pieces inside it, declaring on that basis that it makes no sense to say his computer can beat him at chess. Or like someone who says that because his drive to Ohio is obviously not identical with his car, that therefore magic, and not his car, drove him to Ohio. That's just silly. Can it mean anything meaningful to say that the contents of democracies are physical? Yep. And yet it's just atoms moving around. Can it mean anything meaningful to say that the contents of conversations are physical? Yep. And yet it's just waves of sound or light transferring information from one computer to another. When you account for the structure of the process, yes. It's just physics all the way down. And yet conversations and democracies exist and are fully explained. So, too, will thoughts and experiences be. But what does a democracy weigh, is simply a category error. Democracy is not an object. It's a process. Likewise, a mind is not an object. It's a process. Bartley almost seems to understand that when he lists physical processes as an example of what a physical thing is, but it seems like he doesn't know the difference. He writes physical thing and thinks object. Oops. No, Mr. Bartley. Wrong category of thing there. Bartley probably should have read the first paragraph on this in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Idiomatically we do use, she has a good mind, and, she has a good brain interchangeably, but we would hardly say, her mind weighs 50 ounces. Here I take identifying mind and brain as being a matter of identifying processes, and perhaps states of the mind and brain. Consider an experience of pain, or of seeing something, or of having a mental image. The identity theory of mind is to the effect that these experiences just are brain processes. Brain processes. Not the brain. In discussing this, someone said to me, but surely, mind is typically synonymous with brain, or the physicalist and mind, is not a verb. Neither is my tour of Ohio, or the presidential election verbs. But they are also not physical objects. They are processes. Actions brought about by, and properties of, complex systems of objects. But not identical to the objects themselves. My car can drive me to Ohio, with nothing required but physics, but my car is not, therefore, my drive to Ohio. Bartley says, you do not conceive your experience of the sound you hear as being the same sort of thing as, the activity of brain cells responsible for generating the sound experience. But that's exactly what we conceive it as. Imagine saying your drive to Ohio can't be physical, because you do not conceive of it as being the same sort of thing as rotating gears and pounding explosions inside a metal box. That would be a dumb argument. And also obviously false. Of course my drive to Ohio is in fact identical with rotating gears and pounding explosions inside a metal box. But for that, there would be no drive. The other particulars, like the directions in which that metal box rolled me, hence, to Ohio, completes the equation, but are just more physical facts. What Bartley wants to say is that experiences and neurons are distinctly different properties of existence. Which is true. The warmth of a stop sign is a different property than its shape or color or what's written on it. That it is a mostly red octagonal from one point of view, and nothing but a thin white line from a completely different point of view, when seen on edge, does not argue that it can't be the same thing. Information processing in your computer can be described as just electrons moving around some wires. Or it can be described as an elaborate video game in which you are driving to Ohio in a silver Corvette. Same exact thing. It's all just a matter of from which angle, which perspective, you are looking at it. Yet it's all just physics, all the way down. There is no godly voodoo magic that materializes your silver Corvette or that moves it around a map. It's really just those electrons and wires. Experiences are what a brain process looks like from inside the process, just as a white line is what a stop sign looks like from the side, and a silver Corvette is what that electron process looks like on the display screen. That in no way means stop signs aren't octagonal, or that video games or experiences aren't physical processes. Likewise when Bartley says experiences are not properties of brains in the same sort of way that the physical properties of brains are properties of brains, he's just begging the question. Yes, experiences don't weigh anything or have a length and width, just as democracies and video games don't weigh anything or have a length and width, yet are clearly physical things. But by that same reasoning, weight does not have a length or width either, so weight is not a property of brains in the same sort of way that the physical properties of brains are properties of brains. But, you'd say, weight is a physical property. Well, yeah. So is thought. Oh, I see what you did there. That's what a circular argument looks like. All properties are different from other properties. That's why we call them different properties. That doesn't tell us anything about whether they are physical or not. Hence when Bartley says mind is not just another part of the brain, he is slipping into that same mistake again, thinking a process is an object. Mind is not part of a brain. It's the operation of a brain. It's a different kind of property than weight or length, because it's a process. But we well know processes can be physical. So that being the case, is no argument here. The substance of experience is experience is a nonsense statement. That's like saying the substance of the video game is the video game, therefore video games are magical non-physical beings. Democracy is not a substance. Neither are video games, or minds. Yet democracies and video games are clearly physical systems, realized in physical media. So why can't minds be? To ask what form of matter qualia are made out of is as nonsensical as asking what form of matter the video game or American democracy or my drive to Ohio are made of. These are not things. They are made of stuff. The drive to Ohio is made of tarmac and metal machinery and kinetic energy. The video game is made of electrons, wires, and transistors. Democracy is made of buildings, and books, and people. But there isn't any sense in which these things are those objects. They are what those objects are doing. That's why democracy doesn't have a weight. What would you weigh? The people? Their property? The buildings? The books it's encoded in? Even the video game has no intelligible weight because which transistors and electrons it consists of changes from one moment to the next, and in any event the game is not simply the sum of those parts, but their arrangement. 
and arrangements don't have a weight, nor do actions and events. How it actually works. The mind is to the brain, as the output of a software program is to the microchip it runs on. Note I said the output of the program, not the program by itself. The microchip is not the program. But even the program is not the output of the program. My word processing software is not the novel I wrote with it. These are different things. Mind, experience, is the output. Not the program. Nor even the hardware the program is running on. But the program and hardware are entirely physical and are all that is needed to generate the output, which is the experience. You need them to get that. And you need nothing else to get that. But that is not identity. It's causality. For example, we now know we are not conscious of spans of time smaller than about a twentieth of a second. Which is why movies work. We don't see the individual cells flicker by, one after the other, because they fly past at 24 frames per second, so we only perceive a continuous moving picture. That means if you zoom into a thirtieth of a second, during that whole span of time, consciousness doesn't exist. It only exists as an event extended over time, a time span longer than 33 milliseconds. A thing that doesn't even exist except over a span of time? That's a process. No process, no thought. No thought, no mind. You can have storage of a mind, when you are unconscious, the information stays stored there in the brain, but you aren't conscious. So your mind isn't doing anything. It's turned off. Indeed, to pull off that trick, you need long-term memory storage, one of the many things our brains do for us. But long-term memory can't even be formed to be stored, without first existing in short-term memory, but short-term memory is a process, not a storage system. That's why if you take enough of a drug, like alcohol, that interferes with the ability of your brain to store memory, you can still operate in short-term memory, but none of it gets recorded. Short-term memory, hence experience, hence qualia, hence everything Bartley is saying a mind is, is a process, something the brain is doing, not something the brain is, it's not a stored physical structure in the brain. Hence, mind as experience is a process, not an object. Just as your car is not your drive to Ohio. The same goes all the way up the chain of abstraction. Social constructions, for example, like what words mean, what things to assume, what standards are applied, are analogous to the operating system on your computer. That can be actually present in a culture, or just potentially waiting to be, e.g. as when encoded in a book, in which case it's atomically there in the patterns of ink on paper, for example, but then the meaning of the patterns has to be socially extant somewhere or else it's a dead and indecipherable language like linear A. But when actually present in a culture, the social construct exists atomically as arrangements of interconnected neurons in brains, in the same way iOS exists in multiple iPhones, only there, instead of neurons, it's electrons and transistor gates. We call this a social construct when the same pattern is shared across brains, comprising a given culture. And indeed, that's how we define and distinguish one culture from another. Otherwise, it's an individual construct, or a group construct, but that starts to look like a subculture, and indeed, when we call it a full-blown culture is kind of arbitrary, or pragmatically determined, like how we decide to name a hill a mountain. Though of course it's messier for humans than for iPhones, because cultures overlap, or even nest within other cultures, and cultures continually change and evolve, and represent in a society along a bell curve of intensities across individuals, the same way genes do. And so on. But otherwise the analogy holds. The pattern of neurons in a brain entails an activation sequence, a circuit. Every time a certain idea is thought about, the same or sufficiently similar outputs are generated in every brain that thinks about it. The output will be further ideas or even behaviors, and indeed, thinking is just a category of behavior. Just like pattern recognition software and decision software. It can all be described in terms of nothing more than a physical causal chain of events, just like in a computer, or a system of computers, such as the internet. All without ever mentioning anything more abstract. We create the abstraction, only to make thought and communication more efficient. Hence, social construct is a useful code for a massive complex of stuff. But it's really just a massive complex of stuff. All physical. And we can know this because of two converging reasons. We observe that if we remove the physical components, then the social construct vanishes. And, we observe that nothing needs to be added to the physical system, to explain the social system that results. No extra stuff has to be added to neural circuits, to get a neural circuit to cause certain outputs to arise from certain inputs, or to get a neural circuit in one brain to match a neural circuit in another brain in respect to its input-output profile. It's the same reason we don't include gremlins among the causes of airplane crashes. There is no evidence that we have any need of that hypothesis to explain any crashes. Likewise mind-brain physicalism, even when networked into a social system of interacting physical brains. Social constructs are just what happens when you add more brains. Nothing more is needed to explain that than the adding of more brains. So, too, each individual brain, which is just a system of smaller brains, neurons, and neural circuits, producing individual constructs, which together comprise a mind. Bartley wants there to be something else going on. But we don't have any evidence anything else is. Nor any need of that hypothesis. He is sure that maybe brains physically cause minds to exist, but that in so doing they are creating a whole new ontological thing, called mind or qualia. Maybe. But why think that? It's not needed to explain anything. No additional energy need be devoted to creating any new object. And therefore, no additional substance is needed to realize any new object. Qualia are not objects. Nor are minds. They are events. And as such it is a category error to think they need to be made of anything at all, other than what produces them, a churn of meat, chemicals, and electricity. Bartley says, to say experiences are physical would be to say that these particular so-called physical things exist entirely to minds. And he's right. Experiences are unique to one particular arrangement and activity of matter. Arrangement isn't enough, an unconscious mind experiences nothing. You also need the activation of it, the process of it. But not every process generates experiences. Experiences are an output unique to only one kind of physical process, a mental process. Just as jogging across the street is unique to the existence and motion of legs. 
Outside poetic metaphor, your salary doesn't jog across the street, nor does your car, or your coffee. Is jogging therefore a supernatural phenomenon that requires some new magical substance to exist? Obviously not. Neither does your mind. Only certain arrangements produce certain outcomes. That is an obvious fact of physics. It's not evidence against physics. And, please know your science. Science is philosophy with better data. So philosophers had better know the science of what they are talking about. But Bartley betrays his ignorance of modern science with a bunch of silly statements throughout his screed. I'll just give three examples to illustrate what I mean. 1. Bartley says whitewashing the mind-slash-brain distinction could eliminate the difference for practitioners between whether a psychological problem is physically originated due to a brain dysfunction or brain damage, or mentally sourced due to traumatic experience. No such confusion follows from physicalism. Every therapist already knows that a traumatic experience can only be producing a psychological problem by being physically encoded in the brain, and that the only fix is something that bypasses or rearranges that physical circuit so as to ensure a different output from the input. Talk therapy can do that. But only by physically changing the brain. We all know there is a difference between, for example, genetic or surgical causes of brain organization, and experiential and environmental causes of brain organization. But both are physical causes. Both produce physical rearrangements of the brain. Both respond to the same kinds of therapies. Knowing the distinct cause can be helpful to tailoring treatment, but that in no way requires knowing when the cause is not physical. Because none are. And this a known fact of science. All changes in a mind correspond to changes in the brain. All of them. We've never observed an exception. 2. Bartley says that because, for example, an actual ball we are tracking rolling behind something else is different from our mental experience of the ball, that therefore experience can't be physical. Literally, these ideas all rely on the idea that physical things exist independent of minds. So by definition, a physical object is not only or purely what is in the contents of experience. This means, conversely, that anything that is purely in a mind is not physical, by definition. That's wild nonsense. Obviously, the actual ball outside our mind is a different physical thing than the ball in our mind. Just as a computer simulation of the airspace a plane is flying through is completely different from the actual airspace it's flying through. Does that mean airplane radar readouts therefore cannot be physical systems? This is incoherent nonsense. There is no sense in which a simulation is by definition not a physical system. No more in human minds than in avionic computers. 3. Bartley says we know that some events at a subatomic level are affected by whether there is an observing mind. No. That's not what we've discovered. All we have observed is that when you meddle with an experiment, and any observation requires doing that, e.g. sticking a probe into it, bouncing a particle off it, you affect its outcome. That's true even if minds didn't exist. It's not like unseen stars aren't quantum mechanically burning when we aren't looking at them. Or that we magically created the entire past history of the universe the first moment we looked up at the sky. These are some pretty big fails in science literacy. And anyone who is this ignorant of basic science can't have any credible opinion in an advanced subject like mind-brain physicalism. But this does explain a lot about why Bartley goes so far off the rails and gets all of it wrong. Conclusion Bartley is right to ask why do brains in particular have these mental properties? But we already know the general answer to that question, from comparative neurology and psychology across the animal kingdom and in modern electronics and brain science, these are the properties of information processing, therefore only information processors can generate them, and, we observe, only information processors of enormous complexity and particular organization. Organize them differently, and you get a different output. The internet is complex enough to generate consciousness, but is not at all organized in the way required to do that. If we knew what the required organization was, we could make the internet conscious. But not knowing what arrangement to put the system in to get that output is not evidence of there being no such arrangement it can be put in. I'm inclined to see the most promise in explaining consciousness in something like integrated information theory, minus all the speculation and woo that its proponents sometimes stack atop it, plus it probably needs to be integrated with some form of functionalism, see discussion in Wikipedia and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But we won't really crack the Qualia problem until either we have active brain scanning instruments of extraordinary resolution, allowing us to construct complete and accurate computational circuit diagrams of the human brain, or we develop a general AI capable of helping us do that, using its otherwise alien brain construction to get at the problem from a different but more accessible direction. Might there one day be a complete physical theory that explains why one information processing circuit produces an experience of the color red, rather than green, or a smell, or sound? Yes. I think that's likely. We can't conceive of it yet, because we don't know anything about the underlying computational physics that's causing it. And that physics is surely going to be extremely complex. Even a single neuron is mind-bogglingly complex, in terms of its computational organization. It's the end result of literally billions of years of evolution. Which puts it way the hell ahead of us in design capabilities. 1. IIT theorists do typically argue, in legit peer-reviewed science papers, that consciousness is a property of reality itself and that it is irreducible. Their actual theory, which has some merit, IMO, does not really entail either proposition, though, so I think that's just speculation or semantics gone awry. It's fair to say that no one has proved either proposition with any real scientific experiment or observation. 2. There is a difference between epistemic and causal reductionism, and this may lead to semantic conflation and equivocation fallacy, in the hands of those inexpert at philosophical distinctions, which sadly includes most scientists even. I agree qualia are irreducible epistemically, I discuss this in sense and goodness without God, pages 30 to 32. But that does not mean they are irreducible causally. For example, all emergent phenomena is irreducible in a sense, take a car, if you zero in far enough, you no longer see a car, and if you take away enough parts, it's no longer a car. But that's not what scientists mean by causally irreducible. Obviously a car is just an arrangement of atoms. It's reducible to the parts and their arrangement. Without the parts, there can be no arrangement, and hence no car. 
But nothing additional has to be added to explain the car, just the parts, and their arrangement. Qualia are the same way, take away enough parts of the computer generating the output, and you no longer get the output. So the output is epistemically irreducible. But not causally irreducible. Not any more than a car is. Or anything else. The same equivocation fallacy validates even statements like consciousness is a property of reality itself. Of course that's true in a trivial sense, everything that exists is by definition a property of reality itself. Including cars, apples, hurricanes, even joy. But in that sense, the statement is vacuous. It sounds like it's saying something deep, but really, it's just a fancy way of saying something exists. You can try to redefine the terms so that the statement asserts something other than that, but then usually, the statement becomes false. You need to get more acquainted with the law of large numbers, the size and time scale of the universe and life on Earth, and evolution by natural selection. Because those all explain everything you seem mystified about. And since they explain far more than that, they are the far more probable explanations. You are confusing consciousness with identity. A person is a stored collection of data, they remain a person even when totally unconscious. We are not talking about that. Bartley and I are talking about conscious experience. Not what we are conscious of. Your identity, who you are, your memories, skills, desires, personality, etc., is among what you can be conscious of, but it is not your consciousness. Consciousness does not exist at spans of time below 30 milliseconds. It is a complex computational process that requires at least 30 milliseconds to generate, and for many features, EF self-model, far more, average time to assemble, 500 milliseconds, as discovered by Libet. But you exist even when you aren't conscious. Obviously. Dreamless sleep, even a coma, does not disintegrate you. It just shuts down your mind, so you cannot experience anything, because your brain isn't generating any experiences. That would be a p-zombie. Except that it also doesn't do anything, it can't talk, think, manifest qualia. Hence failing the thought experiment. B. Brain activity is at the atomic scale, so we must be part of an infinity, and not just a quantized world. That sentence makes no logical or scientific sense. I have no idea what you even mean, much less on what basis you can assert any such thing. You are confusing Libet's measure of signaling time, the time it takes for a stimulated nerve to get a signal to the brain, with Libet's measure of consciousness delay, which came to about 500 milliseconds of time it takes for the brain to assemble a conscious impression of what a person reasoned out and thought, and neither is a measure of the smallest time unit of consciousness, Libet wasn't working on that. The smallest unit of time perceivable in consciousness is established by such experiments as the cinemascope, employed most commonly in subliminal signal studies. For example, but as I note in my article, we found the average to be around twice the standard signal length used in many subliminal signal studies, which is why film projection and television work at 24 frames a second, 1 24th equals 42 milliseconds, which is greater than 30 milliseconds. Yes, the brain must generate consciousness to build a narrative memory, and thus an identity model. But the generation remains a time-consuming process, spanning a minimum of 30 milliseconds. The stored results are not the same thing as the process that generates the results to be stored. As to the time span being greater than 30 milliseconds, see 1 30th of a second, I already discussed that in the article you are commenting on, with respect to why film works on us. Please read the article you are commenting on. A person is a stored set of data, not consciousness. Consciousness is only the model your brain builds of you, sometimes inaccurately we now know. You are what you are conscious of, you are not your consciousness. And the more you remove, in stored data or mechanical functions, the more you slide a person into a mere animal and then animals of lower and lower cognitive capacity, e.g. a vegetative state. A person only exists when a certain accumulation of data and active potential is achieved. That's why most animals never become persons. Mind cannot be silent because, mind, equals, experiencing sensation or thought, is a tautology, but that's if you mean by mind only the operation of a brain, active model building, i.e. thinking and experiencing. If you mean by mind the stored information, e.g., the sense in which one still has a mind even when completely unconscious, then you are not talking about consciousness anymore. You're just talking about the potential capabilities of a brain, not their activation. No. Identity remains e
even when unconscious. Identity is a physical pattern of arrangement, currently of neurons, the stored data of the person, comprising the person, memories, inclinations, personality, skills, etc. And the causal history related thereto, a person's continuity over time, continuous, but with change, is a function of causal history. Consciousness is being conscious of the person you are. Consciousness is not the person itself. Computers can be programmed to care about what will happen to them. So that's not a difference. But yes, being consciously aware of a self, and a narrative history of that self, and making decisions to affect the future based on that awareness, is what distinguishes us, even from most other animals. A person requires a narrative history of a self, or the act of building of one. And to do that they have to be able to build a self-model, that includes metacognition, the ability to compare what they are thinking, to what they infer others are thinking, and think about what they themselves are thinking. No animals have that capacity except a very few we almost never encounter, e.g. elephants, certain omnivorous birds, cetaceans, great apes, and even that may be challenged in some cases, though the evidence is intriguing, and is extremely primitive. For example, it's unclear if African greys are self-aware enough to actually build a narrative history of themselves and compare their thoughts to others' thoughts. The best case study was ambiguous on some of these points, and was a one-off yet to be replicated. A person does not exist if there is no cognitive self-model, or none being built. Because a cognitive self-model is ultimately what a person is. And this is not arbitrary. It's simply what we mean by a person, and all inferences we draw from being a person, the ability to enter social contracts, to have self-describable desires, to think about oneself and make decisions based on that self-knowledge, etc., follow only from that property and no other, so we could not arbitrarily change the definition of a person, without destroying all those inferences, and thus eliminating any significance to the word, person would then cease to mean anything relevantly different. From thing. Fetuses are not persons. They are capable of becoming persons, they have the machinery, and in the third trimester are already running the assembly program for it, which creates another key difference, between having the ability to someday have the machinery to become a person, and actually having the machinery to become a person, but the actual attributes of personhood, e.g. the ability to metacognate the difference between self and others, does not actually arise until even many months after birth, we are hindered. By an inability to test it with communication limits, but calm skills are sufficient to verify metacognition already before age 2, and other related skills are booting up well before that. In the U.S., since Roe v. Wade, we have legally assigned personhood, provisionally, or actually, on the grounds of running the assembly program for selfhood, i.e. if the computer is not off or not yet assembled, but actually actively booting up, hence similar rights also extend to full persons who are unconscious, e.g. coma victims, and we begin assigning more rights as the program starts hitting milestones of actualized personhood. No other animal has that assembly program, and thus no other animal can be running it. Except maybe the very few species I mentioned, and even that remains uncertain, e.g. that we could boot up Coco into a person may have more to do with how we programmed her than with how she or other apes would develop naturally in the wild, but the mere fact that we could do that entails she had the equipment to either get there, or get close enough to at least be the liminal case, the data were sufficient IMO to recognize Coco as a person. We should therefore not assume other apes aren't or can't get there too. But most animals have no self-consciousness. And no capacity for it. Some can learn their names and engage in empathy, i.e. read feelings, but this does not correspond to actual metacognition, i.e. they can't model and thus think about what someone else is thinking, with some exceptions, e.g. some monkeys can do this, but have not yet advanced to metacognating themselves, and, again, they can't model themselves, and, in result, they can't think about what they themselves are thinking. And hence they don't build narrative memories of themselves. They thus have no self, nor any sense of self. There is no person assembled in their mind. That said, though, animal rights are not assigned on the basis of animals being persons, they can't enter into social contracts, for example, so human rights would be a meaningless concept to them, and will always be so, i.e. animals aren't even actively developing into beings capable of that. We decide what rights to extend animals based on humanitarian needs, e.g. we don't want persons in our society who enjoy or are callously indifferent to causing pain, and animals definitely feel slash experience pain, so animals become a proxy for detecting dangerous persons, and social needs, e.g. socially we just don't want to live in a system that permits the gratuitous killing of standardized pets, the same reasoning follows for human babies, but they at least are actively becoming persons, in a way pets never are, likewise any animal we allow the eating of. Neonates are provisional persons under the law, on the grounds that they are actively compiling a person in their minds, in fact this starts in third trimester before birth, hence Roe v. Wade allowed state interest in protecting fetal rights in the third trimester, and only disallowed that for earlier trimesters, on the grounds that compiling was not in those stages occurring. But no, they do not fully become persons until sometime in their second year. Severe dementia has no effect on self-model awareness or self-model building or narrative memory, it only hinders access to some of that memory, or in some cases, the adding of new memories to it. So they have not lost any aspects of personhood. They have only lost access to some pieces of themselves as persons. Wanting to kill a baby for such trivial reasons proxies you as a sociopath, indeed it would be disturbing even to kill a pet for so trivial a reason. We don't want sociopaths who kill so arbitrarily running around free. Nor could you rationally feel good about yourself being one. Which is what makes it immoral to choose to be one, you may instead be insane, but then we lock you up for that, too. Precisely what worries you about people doing that, is exactly why you ought not do that. But that reason has nothing to do with babies having fully developed cognitive self-models. It only has to do with babies actively building those self-models, and the cruelty of interrupting that active process. It is that that we value, and why we abhor anyone who would not value it. But if babies weren't building self-models, they'd just be like most other animals, and never progress to any other state. They should then be treated with the same sympathy as most animals warrant. But not as persons or anything becoming a person. Babies who never build self-models would be indistinguishable from pets. What we want to know when we want to know if there is a person, is whether there is metacognitive self-awareness, or an active process of its assembly. That's an objective reality that matters, not a subjective wish. 
because only entities without property can engage in moral reasoning and thus be held responsible for their decisions, and only entities without property can negotiate, enter, and maintain social contracts and thus be treated as entities that do, and only entities without property can value their own lives and thus have futures that matter to them, as opposed to having no concept of the future or of oneself or even of what life or death is. If instead you want person to just mean any object we want to treat a certain way, then even rocks and emotions can be persons, which renders the word useless. Stick to practical reality. Stop trying to define words out of existence. As to the matter of a conceptus, a conceptus is no more a person than a stem cell in your finger is, they both have the exact same DNA and potential capabilities. There is a non-trivial difference between a disassembled computer that is being assembled, and an already assembled computer that is booting up, experiencing the world, and compiling results from those experiences. Likewise, there is a non-trivial difference between a fetus that has no functioning or operating brain yet, it's still being built, like the computer still being built, and a fetus that does have a functioning and operating brain and is in fact actively using that brain to build and assemble a continuous mind. There is also a non-trivial difference between that and a fully cognitive person. These are actual objectively factual differences. Renaming them can never change that fact. And thus no name you give them can ever change the consequences of each different fact. Hence rights are attenuated to abilities. Rights of provisional persons exist for actual provisional persons, not potential provisional persons, only potential rights exist for potential things, actual rights only obtain for actual things. And the rights of full persons exist for completed persons. And the rights of partial persons exist for partial persons. Thus a baby has fewer rights than a toddler, a toddler fewer rights than an adolescent, and so on. These are not trivial distinctions. They are real distinctions, fundamental to organizing a functional society. One cannot wish it any other way. What works is what works. Regardless of what we think or wish would work. We can't make a baby a functional adult by calling it an adult. Nor can we make a river a functional person by calling it a person. Similarly, the fear I have that you would disregard an animal with an active mind that is actively becoming a person and gratuitously kill it is that this makes you a danger to me and society because it signals you have no empathy or respect for developing personhood. That would be an objective fact about you. Not a subjective feeling of mine. And that's why being such a person would make you a bad person. Someone we need to take steps against. As for animals, we gain vastly more utility from them than nutrition or pleasure. Literally hundreds of material products, many you depend on in your life, employ components from slaughtered or husbanded animals. Our only obligation to them is to treat them humanely. They otherwise have no concept of life or future. They do not value having a future, they don't even know what a future is. And they do not value themselves. Because they have no selves. Death literally means nothing to them. And never will mean anything to them. If that were different, if pigs actually were actively developing into metacognitive selves who could comprehend and thus value being alive, and we just needed to wait for that to finish compiling, then we should help them do that, take care of them, and not interfere by killing them unnecessarily. But pigs don't become that. Therefore, none of the obligations we'd have to them if they did, exist. The phenomena don't exist, so the obligations don't exist. And finally, the condition of losing all your narrative memories of yourself is called being brain dead. And the dead are certainly not persons. Not anymore. Note that even worms learn the same kinds of things chickens do including the worm that they programmed into a robot, which had just 302 neurons. Does it have a concept of time? Certainly not. Of itself? Certainly not. Data is information about a thing. Numbers are one kind of information, but not the only kind. And a thing is not the same as the data that describe it. A person is like a car engine. The structure is what makes it what it is, not just the isolated bits of information. Bits of information can't propel an automobile. The arrangement of the structure does that. You can have data about what that structure is, but the structure is not the data. Also, we can sometimes use the software-hardware analogy in neurology, but it's not literally applicable. Software is only a thing in Turing machines. Human brains are not Turing machines. They are analog, not digital computers. Software is a way to make a universal Turing machine behave like another machine. But you could do that by skipping the Turing machine and software and just building the machine you want to emulate. It's then all hardware, no software. Human brains are all hardware, not software. Conscious awareness is then among the things that that machine does. It's the output, not the software. Indeed it is the output of the hardware, not of any software. The human brain is configurable, so it's all hardware, but it can change, update, expand, reorganize, which we don't really have an analogy to in computing yet. So we use software as the closest analogy, despite it being a stretch, per above, software also comes close to what we mean by short-term memory, but even then the analogy is not exact. Computers roll out of the factory with fixed hardware, not continuously reconfigurable hardware. That's simply because the former is easier to manufacture and operate and maintain on present technology. We could in principle build configurable hardware systems, which would then be more correctly analogous to human brains, we just don't have any good reason to at present. The fixed hardware turning machines we have are, currently, far cheaper and easier to build and maintain. As to what you are asking about a person, I'm not sure what you mean. If you mean, a computer has to be configured in a certain way for it to be a person, as opposed to, say, an iPhone or wristwatch or arcade game console, then that's obviously true. Just as a different configuration makes a watch versus a game console or an iPhone. A thing is how it is configured. Configure it differently, and it's a different thing. This is true of literally all things whatever. So that it is also true of persons is a trivial observation. Meanwhile, all currently known people are animals. So I assume you mean, rather, that non-human animals can become persons somehow. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Which animals are you talking about? It's possible that some animals have brains configurable to manifest a person. Coco the gorilla, for example, is a likely candidate. But in every case, it comes down to whether they are configured that way. 
just as whether you have a watch or a phone comes down to how the thing you have is configured. Consequently, you have committed a common fallacy, which I dubbed in sense and goodness without God the Motohawk fallacy, or just this fallacy. I suggest you read my discussion of it there, index, Motohawk. But in short, a tree is just atoms. But it's still a tree and not, say, a pile of ashes. The only difference between a tree and a pile of ashes is how the atoms are configured. But that's a really huge difference. There is therefore never any real sense in which a thing is just atoms, a thing is atoms plus arrangement. And it is the combination of both from which all properties derive, e.g. a tree can grow and provide years of shade to sit under, a pile of ashes cannot, even if both are made of exactly the same atoms. Thus there is never any sense in which anyone is just a biological machine. A plant and a tiger are both biological machines, yet there is no sense in which they are the same or have the same abilities and attributes. What makes them different is the way those machines are configured. Thus they are machinery plus configuration. Just like people are. There is no effect of this realization on ethics. Ethics is a property of persons, by virtue of the way persons are configured, causing them to have particular abilities and attributes not possessed by other configurations of the very same atoms. Saying they are just atoms doesn't have any effect here. Because they are more than just atoms, they are a configuration of atoms. Just as a tree is more than just atoms, hence it is different from a pile of ashes. The difference is all in the configuration of the atoms, and what powers and abilities that configuration thus bestows. We are all computers. The only differences are as spelled out above, what we are programmed to do, and information processing of increasing complexity probably produces qualia, and the most complex is self-model building, which leads to self-awareness, and thus the ability to talk about the qualia of being an information processor. He then suggested plenty of animals also build self-models of the same complexity. That's the comment you are quoting. Which isn't true. Only very few animals come even close e.g. elephants, certain omnivorous birds, cetaceans, and great apes, and they are still not complex enough in their self-models to communicate details of their own metacognition, e.g. even Coco was never documented discussing qualia. Thinking and remembering and learning even a robot can do. Building a self-model and doing metacognition with it, cats don't do. Nor do they have the architecture for it. No part of their brain has been identified as doing that, and all parts of their brain are accounted for by comparative and experimental anatomy. Note there is a difference between consciousness as an experiencing qualia and using them to learn and make decisions, even worms, and indeed, IMO, probably even robots, have that, and consciousness as in self-consciousness, which does not mean learning that mirrors don't contain enemy cats, that requires no recognition of self at all, there is a reason the mirror test has been highly criticized as useless, in some cultures, even human children fail mirror tests as late as age 6, yet pass. Sophisticated tests for metacognitive self-awareness, which, notably, cats do not. Personhood is a property of self-consciousness beings, or beings actively building that self-consciousness. Not of just anything that's conscious. Again, even worms are conscious in that looser sense. So we need to be careful to avoid equivocation fallacies. Modern computers are multidimensional networks now. Your own desktop computer is comprised of multiple CPUs running complex parallel programming. And the physical processor is irrelevant anyway. It's the software, the actual information processing, that makes the difference. Hence neural nets can be run on standard machines now. In other words, everything an animal brain does, a machine can now do. The only thing left to discover is figuring out the precise wiring. That's it. Configuration. There is no other difference. Robots can learn and model the structure of their own bodies now. That this inevitably entails they experience qualia has been pointed out since Dennett analyzed Shaky the robot in consciousness explained 40 years ago. We've already replicated a complete worm brain with software, and it works. Which means all qualia, the worm experiences, that robot experiences. It's the same brain. Process is all that matters. Configuration. Not the material it's made of. We and all other animals are also just computing inputs and generating output about a specific task it was designed and programmed to do. We are just a configuration wires. We are just a massively complex input-output algorithm, run in parallel processing, through a neural net. The only fundamental difference is that we are programmed by evolution, our base program is the brain structure, how it is wired by the third trimester, which is built under instruction by the DNA code, another bit of software, and environment, we are programmed to self-program through learning by interacting with the environment, we now have robots that do this, too. Sentience is just another program. It's just another form of information processing. Shaky the robot and the Lipson's bot also make complex decisions based on all sorts of complex sensory information from the surrounding environment. Hence they learn what structure and capabilities their bodies have, and the structure and capabilities of their environment, they are programmed with neither information, and use that information to navigate environments and obstacles. Animals do the same thing. Like the worm bot. Which literally has exactly the same brain as an actual worm. Only it's made of software code instead of neurons. We are all machines. The only differences that matter among these machines is how complex the information processor is, and how integrated the information processing is, this latter part is what makes the difference between, for example, the worm bot and Shaky and the Lipson Zykoff, and some non-learning, straight-code industrial robot, although even the latter might experience qualia, it just will be even simpler and vaguer than what animals do or advanced bots like the worm or Shaky, and consequently what it is. Capable of being conscious of. Are animals conscious of things? Yes. So is Shaky. And the worm bot. And the Lipson Zykoff bot. Are animals conscious of themselves? No. No more than those robots are. Are animals conscious of consciousness? As in, does their information processing ability include metacognition? No. Are animals consciousness of having a future? No. Will animals ever be conscious of having a future? No. Are animals conscious of themselves as individuals with thoughts and goals and history? No. 
Will animals ever be conscious of themselves, as individuals with thoughts and goals and history? No. Do animals have information processors complex enough and configured to comprehend the value of life and comprehend death and comprehend themselves as persons? No. Do animals have information processors complex enough and configured to develop the ability to comprehend the value of life and comprehend death and comprehend themselves as persons? No. Again, there are a few exceptions, a very small list of species, as I already noted, and humans. And this makes the objective factual difference between full persons, partial persons, developing persons, and non-persons. If a brain cannot construct a comprehension of itself as a person, if it can't metacognate a self-awareness, it cannot construct a person. No construct of a person, no person. Period. How we value these different categories relates to what they can accomplish. Non-persons never have personal rights because they will never be persons. Developing persons will have provisional personal rights because they are actively developing into persons. Partial persons will have partial personal rights because they are partially persons. But things that are none of these things, not actively developing into persons, nor partial persons, etc., are not persons. The word person has no utility in society under any other definition. Human personhood, however, is a product of more than merely the metacognitive structures in the prefrontal cortex. The self-model, and narrative memory etc., is constructed in across many areas of the whole cerebral cortex, which in humans is vastly more complex than in almost any other animal. It is again the structures, not the labeled anatomical areas, that we are concerned with. A cat's cerebral cortex is far simpler and lacks the structures distinctive of human abilities, like self-model generation and narrative memory formation. Being conscious of qualia is not the same thing as being conscious of oneself. All animals, even worms, must be conscious of qualia. Which means the robot we built using the map of a worm's brain must be conscious of qualia. Indeed, the very same qualia that worm knew when in its previous body. Self-consciousness is a far more complex output of information processing. It requires a far more complex processor. Indeed, just the gigabytes of structure needed to run human consciousness alone far exceeds the gigabytes of structure in an entire cat's brain. 91,000 gigabytes in a typical cat brain, 2.5 million gigabytes in the human brain, of which at least 10% comprises the cerebral cortex, or 250,000 gigabytes, almost three times more than the entire cat's brain. When the information processor thus stimulated produces perception as its functional output, that entails qualia, and hence consciousness of qualia. Hence the kind of consciousness animals, e.g. worms, mice, cats, experience. But if you mean that is not the same thing as self-consciousness, I agree. This is exactly what I've been explaining to you. Consciousness of a self is a vastly more complex output requiring a vastly more complex information processor. So do sufficiently complex robots, like the ones I listed above. Any computer that generates and operates on perception of the environment is generating subjective experience of reality. Like Shaky the robot does. And the wormbot and the lips and Zykoff bot. And all animals are doing when they generate their subjective experience of reality is run a program, input generating output, operating mechanically according to physical logic gates, they are just more complex robots. It's all just wires, whether of metal or flesh. Configuration of circuits. Nothing more. Worms learn, respond to the environment, and model their environment and make decisions from that modeling. There is no reason at all to assume this does not come with associated qualia. Any act of perception must entail some form of qualia. Unless you think only at a certain level of complexity of information processing do qualia start to manifest. But then, that's just all there is to it, at a certain level of complexity, qualia are experienced. That's still not consciousness of self, consciousness of death, consciousness of thought, and so on. The difference is always just more wires, more circuits, more complex neural connections. That's the only difference between a worm and a cat, the cat has more neurons, and can thus do more complex information processing. But the cat is just an information processor, same as the worm. There is no fundamental difference. Just complexity. First test, do they have a brain of enough complexity to generate a self-model and associated metacognition? That's not sufficient, since some animals, e.g. the octopus, have the requisite neural complexity, but devote almost all of it to doing something else. In the case of the octopus, it runs its dermal camouflage system. So you then have to study anatomically, what do the complex brain centers do? For example, we have studied metacognition in primates by studying the physical operation of their mirror neuron network. Having a mirror neuron network is a structural requirement for all metacognition, including self-metacognition, though monkeys do not display the latter ability. Though having a mirror neuron network is again not sufficient to develop complex metacognition, much less self-cognition. Those require many other structures, so we can study whether animals physically have those structures in their brains. Almost all do not, or not enough of them, to meet the requirement. And finally, metacognition and self-cognition produce externally observable and testable behaviors. Almost no animals exhibit those behaviors, they don't act on metacognitive knowledge, therefore they don't have metacognitive knowledge, they don't act on self-cognitive knowledge, therefore they don't have self-cognitive knowledge. Read up on how we discovered the remarkable cognitive abilities of the rare few animals that have them, that teaches you how we know other animals don't have those abilities. For example, Wikipedia has a good article on elephant cognition. The studies of bird intelligence, through brain anatomy and behavioral tests and observations, are more scattered and inconclusive, some not sufficiently rigorous or unreplicated, but you can get a start in the entry on bird intelligence. The birds with requisite anatomy and behavior may include the magpie, African gray, and crow. Likewise apes, but the same problems in the science persist there. See this analysis of the behavioral tests of Coco's cognition. And citations. We are all just reacting to stimuli, but it is not simply that, because our stimuli are more complex, a neural network generates experiential perception as the stimulus, not a mere tit-for-tat reaction, and our ability to react to those stimuli is more complex, reason, intelligence, comprehension. But most animals don't have the latter. They have perceptual experiences as stimuli, but all they do is react to them. They can never think about them. 
much less think about themselves. They have no sense of self. No equipment to build any stimuli as complex as a self-model. They have no metacognition. They have no self-cognition. And we know this. It's a scientific fact. It's an observationally confirmed fact. It's an anatomically confirmed fact. So once again, sentience in the sense you mean is not self-consciousness. It's not metacognition. It is not the assembly of a person. It's therefore not being a person. All sentient beings are as information processors. Absolutely nothing else. Just that. Therefore any information processing that does the same thing will have subjective experiences. QED. What information processing does that? We have observed it to be anything that produces an output of integrated perception. Do robots do that now? Yes. I gave you several examples. And now we've even made a robot with an identical information processor to an animal, a worm, that does that. There is, to the contrary, no reason to believe these robots don't have subjective experiences. But having subjective experiences is not being a person in any useful sense relevant to how society employs the term person. If all you want to mean by person is having experiences, then robots are persons, worms are persons, every information processor producing integrated perception is a person, and that simply dilutes the meaning of the word. It then no longer has any significance to call something a person. It's meaningless. It then is just a synonym for sentient, which entails nothing as to rights, powers, or dispositions. And as it then makes no distinctions as to powers, rights, and dispositions, it has no use. We may as well do away with the word. Because they have no self. So there would be no me having those experiences. I could not think about them, comprehend them, appreciate them, or do anything with them cognitively, because there would be no I to do any of those things. I would simply be a non-cognitive reasoner reacting to perceptual stimuli, I would be having experiences, but incapable of thinking about those experiences or relating them to any concept of myself. I would have no narrative memory built out of them. We know already what it takes to get the latter kind of mind, anatomical equipment almost no animals have, and we know this because we have observed the correlation between having that equipment and exhibiting all the abilities it entails, and lacking that equipment and lacking all the abilities it entails. That's just fact. So please stop denying well-established science. So how do we know a worm robot has the same experiences as a worm? Because of that same fact, we observe when you have the equipment, you have the ability, nothing else needs to exist. There is no special secret magical fluid or something that gets added. It's just a neural net that generates integrated perception. Period. That's it. There is nothing else. Which means when you have that, you have the effects of it, subjective experience. To argue otherwise is to argue for some special secret magical fluid or something that has to get added. But there is no evidence any such mumbo jumbo exists or has any role to play in generating subjective experience. And we confirm this by observing the worm exhibits the abilities that result from having an integrated perception of something, it learns, it builds a model of its environment, and it reacts to phenomena that require more than mere tit-for-tat impulses, it is doing more than direct reflect action. It therefore must have some form of integrated perception. Because if it didn't, it couldn't do those things. Dennett explains this quite well in his analysis of Shaky the Robot as I directed you to earlier. Therefore, it has the anatomy that causes those effects. Therefore we know it must cause those effects. And those effects are the observed behavior and subjective experience. Extremely primitive and simple subjective experience. But subjective experience all the same. To suggest otherwise is to insist there has to be some additional special secret magical fluid or something that gets added. But you have no evidence any such thing exists, nor any reason to believe any such thing exists. It's who nonsense. Now, as I said, maybe, perhaps, subjective experience emerges only at a certain complexity of integrated information processing, and maybe that certain complexity is more complex than a worm brain. We have no evidence whatsoever that that's the case. But let's just suppose. What complexity does it arise at, and how do you know that? Maybe it only arises at human complexity, so that in fact even cats don't ever have subjective experiences, they aren't even sentient. You have no more reason to deny that than to affirm it. If you are going to arbitrarily insist some degree of complexity is needed and you have no idea how much. But here's why that's not likely to hold up. It would be extremely improbable, a really bizarre coincidence, that a cat could behave in ways that require the equipment we know generates subjective experience, yet not generate subjective experience. And if that's true for the cat, it's true for the worm. And if it's true for the worm, it's true for the worm robot. And if it's true for the worm robot, it's true of the other robots I described, which are even more complex than the worm bot. Any system that generates integrated perception, generates qualia. We therefore have zero reason to believe any system that generates integrated perception, doesn't generate qualia. If you want to arbitrarily invent some special point at which extra more complexity is needed, then that point may well be for all we know way past cats. So your own reasoning eliminates even the sentience of cats. And the only escape from that consequence is to appeal to the correlation of cat behavior with qualia generation. And that argument entails worms and robots experience qualia, not the same qualia, but some primitive qualia. There is no way to escape this conundrum. If the argument works for cats, it works for worms. And if it works for worms, it works for robots. And you have exactly zero evidence otherwise. Worms react to pain. Why then should we think they don't feel the pain they react to? There is no scientific or plausible reason they shouldn't. It would be a bizarre coincidence that when worms and cats react to the same thing, pain, that one experiences what they are reacting to and the other doesn't. If you can react to the perception of pain without experiencing pain, why would animals ever have evolved the ability to experience pain at all? And what extra magical, fluid thingy has to be added to get a pain perception circuit to also generate an experience of what is being felt? 
As Cottrell argues in Sniffing the Camembert, see again the article you are here commenting on, there is no logical argument to be had here. If two entities are reacting to pain, they are both perceiving pain, and if they are perceiving pain, they are experiencing pain. Full stop. Because sentience only tells us which things can have experiences, and thus what things we should be humane to, i.e. help them avoid pain and suffering or at least not add more than they'd experience without our care. Rights attenuate to abilities. Very few rights are entailed by merely having experiences. The more capabilities, the more rights. But the rights of persons, as currently defined by society, e.g. under the law, attach only to entities that build self-models, i.e. that build persons. And almost no animals do that. From there, you can have varying degrees of personhood, potential, provisional, partial, and full. But those degrees require increasing stages of person development. And only brains that have the extremely complex anatomy required to build persons, selves, can manifest any of those stages. All other brains cannot generate self-consciousness, cannot think about themselves or what they are experiencing, cannot build narrative memories of themselves, cannot plan or comprehend life or death or the future, they are all just systems of non-cognitive perception, habit, and reaction. The future means nothing to them. Death means nothing to them. Because they do not have the anatomical equipment we know is needed to comprehend any of those things. Confabulation, that's abnormal, not normal, brain behavior. Yes, when you break the brain, it screws up. That does not mean it screws up when it's not broken. The brain is always trying to guess at the story of you, it's building a model of you, just as it builds a model of the world around you. But it's not perfect, it will get things wrong, e.g. misestimate a distance or the presence of water, misguess a motive, etc. But the only reason it does this at all is because it usually gets things right. If it didn't, it wouldn't have evolved these abilities. So yes, when we stick electrodes into a brain or cut wires, we can confuse it into making mistakes in its construction of models. That's uninformative of what it does when we aren't screwing with it or damaging it. But this has nothing to do with what we are talking about here, cat brains can't even confabulate narratives about themselves. And we know this because they lack the brain anatomy required for it, and exhibit no behavior that would result from it. So yes, we very well know what cat brains can and can't do. Because if they don't have a brain structure to do it with, they physically can't possibly be doing it. And if they exhibit none of the behavior that would result from their doing it, they obviously aren't doing it. Finally, persisting at a behavior does not indicate knowledge of the future. It is not planning. It's simply repetition until enough cycles indicate futility. That's a completely intuitive, non-cognitive, habitual response. Metacognition, being able to think about what others are thinking and act on that information. Self-cognition, being able to think about oneself as a person and one's own thoughts and desires and act on that information. No animals pass these tests except, possibly, the very few species I listed. Cats definitely don't pass any tests of these things, unlike those other species. Surprise at things being different than they have been habituated to expect is not metacognition nor self-cognition. Learning after repeated tries that something doesn't work is not metacognition nor self-cognition. You are confusing intelligence, which even worms have, and even robots have now, with metacognition and self-cognition. These are not the same thing. Person does not mean an entity that has some intelligence. If it did, then it would just mean learning algorithm, as even robots exhibit learning intelligence now. And all animals do. Even worms and gnats. But if person just means learning algorithm, it doesn't mean anything useful. We may as well just do away with the word and stick with the one we already have. We don't have to see atoms to know they probably don't contain elves and don't require supernatural powers to work. We can build multiple corroborating lines of evidence to ascertain the entire structure of the atom. We now know it all the way down to quarks and leptons, without knowing everything about the atom or even being able to see one. That we don't know why quarks exist or have the masses they do and operate as they do, does not undermine atomic physicalism. Same for the brain. We have multiple corroborating lines of evidence confirming consciousness is only produced by physical machinery. And that's it. End of story. There is no evidence of anything else. No elves in atoms. No elves in your head. Just a computer. You also need to get up to speed. You seem ignorant of the science. No one thinks there is a singular place in the brain that is conscious. Modern cognitive science establishes consciousness is a product of the whole complex machine, not a place in the machine. Neuroscience establishes, via six lines of converging evidence, that nothing more is involved in producing human consciousness than physical information processing. You created a cognitive twin and then killed them. Unless you add that they resurrect them unharmed after, which you didn't. That's the objective reality neuroscience, and indeed just physics, full stop, describes. The mere fact that we don't cognitively twin ourselves is trivial, we could have been like amoebas and reproduced this very way. It's merely an accident of evolution that we reproduce not by cognitive twinning but by gamete mixing, which, also by accident of history, can sometimes create only genetic, not cognitive twins. If on the other hand you are talking about changing as a person, people's brains, hence minds, change constantly, as do trees, houses, nations, you evidently have a confused and completely unusable concept of identity, one that would allow me to legally steal everything you own, because it's no longer exactly the same stuff you paid for or built. As for two brains that are biologically connected via a single neuron cell, a single neural cell would be incapable of sustaining a conscious link between them. Such brains would be two separate brains, even more so than split brain patients, who have a substantial number of surviving connections, in the billions. Yet one half of their brain remembers and sees and learns things the other does not, and thus has a different causal history. They are thus halfway between being one person and two separate people, and the only thing preventing the latter are those connections yet remaining, which are basal and thus more fundamental to personhood. Even so, that one half is separately conscious from the other solely due to a physical severing of physical neurons refutes any notion that anything non-physical is going on in producing their consciousness. So even that example refutes you. Meanwhile, all the other examples you list here are just a single brain, not separate brains. 
They would thus generate a single, distinct, separate consciousness. Only someone who knew little about the actual neuroscience of consciousness could think just anything can be conscious. Neuroscience has proved the contrary, that nothing is needed to produce consciousness. Neuroscience has proved the contrary, or that just any part of a brain by itself can produce full human consciousness. Neuroscience has proved the contrary. And nothing in neuroscience rules out the future production of superbrain superconsciences, precisely because of the necessary and sufficient link between physical structure and consciousness neuroscience has amply proved to date, and nothing in neuroscience rules out the possibility of isolated subbrain consciences, human and subhuman, but in fact has proved them physically possible, and explained their existence solely with physical facts, e.g. splitbrain patients exhibit dual consciousness. A person is the sum of memories, personality traits, desires, reasoning, and other skills, and like attributes, that distinguishes them as an individual, combined with the ability to generate conscious models of themselves. Every single one of those things has been proved to be the physical product of physical computation in a physical organ, without which the property ceases to operate or exist. We have six more converging lines of evidence, each one of which is improbable on your theory, but fully expected on mind-brain physicalism, and that is why almost all neuroscientists today, the actual experts, are mind-brain physicalists, and thus why you are only pushing pseudoscience. 1. General brain function correlation. Never once has anyone ever observed a human mind functioning in the absence of a functioning brain. 2. Specific brain function correlation. For every individual function of consciousness, nothing mental happens without something physical happening. 3. Positive evidence mapping the mind to the brain. Nearly every conceivable mental event has been identified with a physical location in the brain that has been mapped. 4. Negative evidence mapping the mind to the brain. We can remove a property of consciousness by removing the physical circuit that generates it, e.g. we can remove your ability to identity faces by removing the face recognition circuit, yet the rest of your consciousness remains. We can remove your ability to see a color by removing the color recognition circuit, yet the rest of your consciousness remains. We can create two partially separate consciousnesses in one brain by physically cutting. The wiring between the two halves of the brain, the result of which one side is not aware of what the other side is experiencing, and so on. 5. Brain chemistry and mental function. When the brain lacks certain chemicals, or has too much, the mind will fail in certain ways, or change in personality, that the mind can be so affected by brain chemistry makes more sense on mind-brain physicalism than any other theory. 6. Comparative anatomy and explicability. The mental powers of animals increase in direct correlation to the increased complexity of their brains. And in every species, when an animal, including humans, develops its mental abilities further, or gains skills, memories, cognitive abilities, etc., this is always matched by the development of neurons or synapses in their brains. None of these things is likely if a transcendent mind was causing any of these effects we collectively call consciousness. But all of these things are likely if the physical operation of physical circuitry is causing them. The likelihood ratio thus strongly supports mind-brain physicalism being the eventual explanation of it all. So it would be a waste of resources to investigate or test any other theory. Q1, it would depend on what you would consider addressing. The objection is a fallacy of infinite goal posts. As soon as we show a function entirely dependent on a brain circuit, they retreat and say, well, maybe some subfunction of that function requires a non-brain part, then we show that that subfunction is entirely dependent, and so on. Once you see this happen a dozen times, their retreat has lost all prior probability. If every time we ask, does this subfunction require a brain part, and we are able to test and we find out, we find brain is required, it is no longer credible to claim next time we'll get a different answer. That's simply unlikely at that point. Moreover, mind-brain physicalism follows from converging lines of evidence, not a single line of evidence. We can remove a function, we can stimulate a function, we can restore a function, we can alter a function, never have we found any function remains, any memory of it either, apart from the brain. And the causal cascade is always physical, for instance, we can physically trace the brain circuit that invents the color yellow, it is a processor that takes the RGB inputs from the eye and calculates when a differential signal should produce yellow, but it is in a different place than the RGB circuits, and is physically wired from them, and physical wires come out, which we can cut, and the signal won't get to another processing circuit of the brain, and we can observe that that signal doesn't get there, altering consciousness accordingly. It violates Occam's razor to observe all this and conclude, well, but, maybe there is something else as well, something not only required, but capable of maintaining structure and operation without all this circuitry, as that is like observing Newton predicts all the planets' motions and concluding, well, maybe there are also angels pushing the planets. That just isn't a scientifically plausible conclusion at that point. It is also two different things to theorize something else is required, there has never been any evidence of this, no mysterious sources of energy are interacting with the human brain, for example, all brain events so far have been entirely accounted for by ordinary metabolism and electrochemical neurocircuitry, and that something can still maintain structure and function without the brain. The latter theory has been decisively refuted. If you need me to explain why brain damage studies accomplish that I'll elaborate, but it should be obvious. If awareness of people's faces, for example, requires the brain circuit that does that, and removing that circuit removes that ability, and thus all memories associated with doing it, so it's not like there is a second brain somewhere accomplishing this task and recording it while the first brain fails to do either, there isn't any way to claim that this ability survives the removal, the destruction, of that part of the brain. And as every function of consciousness has been correspondingly traced to a corresponding brain circuit that once removed removes that ability, if you remove all of them, there is nothing left that would count as consciousness, much less a person, who is a collection of memories and proclivities and skills and so on, all of which we proved cease to exist when the corresponding part of the brain is removed. Every function and subfunction of consciousness and its discovered neural requirements. The argument from physics only works empirically. There is no a priori reason if second substance, like, say, ectoplasm, or a dimensionless point or matterless volume possessed of mind properties, couldn't also engage in energy exchanges with normal matter and force particles. So the issue is not that this is impossible, but that it simply isn't observed. So the hypothesis of soul matter, or soul fields, or soul points, or whatever is merely empirically false, not logically impossible. If any of that stuff existed, it would obey its own physics, and in harmony with all other known physics. 
So dualism is not impossible conceptually. It's just false empirically. Only dualisms that are radically non-physical might be logically impossible. But it's really hard to describe such a thing. Such a mind must lack not just mass, but also volume or any physically distinguishable content, so as to in no way be describable as itself, just another physical entity, which also means it must lack any ability to interact with normal energy and matter, e.g. it can have no EM charge, or ability to generate EM charge, so as to move anything, which would be self-contradictory. How could a mind particle, as we would then have to be describing, produce observable effects in the world and not be interacting with anything in the physical world? That's a direct contradiction of description. There is a sense in which only dualisms that are just another version of physicalism, like ectoplasm models, can have any logical potential to explain anything. Narrative memory is what it sounds like, you remember yourself and your life in the form of a causal narrative, which memory you can move around in consciously, and thus pick a time in your life to recall, and relate it causally, to times before and after, all the way to now, and thence into the future, hence you can consciously plan. Animals don't form or use memories this way. And that is just one component of what constitutes personhood generally, a self-model, consciously explorable. Your brain builds a cognitive model of you as an individual and all its properties, desires, plans, and the like. You are thus capable of thinking of yourself as an I and others as a you or a they, and you can navigate around your self-model the same way you, and many animals, can navigate around a model of their external environment. Which entails a corresponding scale of metacognition. You can model other minds besides your own and thus understand and appreciate what other people are thinking, experiencing, wanting, and so on, and also track their narrative histories. In short, conscious awareness of existing and existence, and all that that entails. What does it mean to call consciousness an illusion? A question is being asked a lot lately, how can the most prominent position held by scientists and philosophers be that consciousness doesn't exist? Obviously consciousness exists. It's literally the only thing you can know with absolute 100% certainty. I think, therefore I am. Cartesian knowledge. That you are experiencing certain things right now is literally undeniable. Your sense of self, what you are thinking and feeling, sights and sounds integrated into a unified sensory field, your ability to reason in a stream of connected thoughts and be aware that you are doing so. That you are experiencing these things when you are cannot be denied. What that means, of course, can be doubted. Does it mean there is a physical world, that you are the operational product of a complex wetware computer, called the brain? Or is anything you are experiencing real, at all, as opposed to just a fantasy, or hallucination, or lucid dream? Is solipsism true? Or are we just brains in a vat? Does our consciousness prove we have a disembodied soul? Or that anyone even could? I've already covered the question of how we know the external world is real, and all that jazz, and that our consciousness is communicating information to us and not just making everything up, see my discussion of Cartesian demons, for a start. And most people get that distinction, how consciousness can be a construct, yet still be communicating information about reality apart from it. But the question seems to be now that experts are claiming that even the construct doesn't exist, that consciousness its very self doesn't exist. An example of a work going around leading people to think that this is what's being said is Daniel Dennett's Illusionism as the Obvious Default Theory of Consciousness, Journal of Consciousness Studies 23, 2016. Dennett himself never uses any language like consciousness doesn't exist. That is usually formulated by people opposing his point, because they fail to get his point. But in common English saying consciousness is an illusion is saying consciousness doesn't exist. And this failure to appreciate everyday semantics is an all too common error in academic philosophy today. I'm here to correct that mistake. Philosophers need to start taking colloquial semantics more seriously. I've had issues with this entire trend in philosophy called eliminativism, where all sorts of things are claimed not to exist that actually do, like truth or propositions. This is actually just shitty semantics, no one who actually advances such a view actually means these things don't exist at all, but only that they are different things than is usually assumed. So they shouldn't be using words and phrases like eliminativism, no, you have not eliminated truth and propositions, you've simply redefined what you think they are, which is not the same thing, or doesn't exist, no, you mean, the thing is traditionally conceived doesn't exist, but that something does very much exist, it's just a different thing than commonly thought. I've already explained this point before with respect to truth and propositions, and even beliefs, as claimed not to exist by the otherwise excellent philosophers Paul and Patricia Chechland, seek giving the Chechlands a fairer shake in my critical review of Repert. TL, DR, they actually just argue these exist as different things than usually thought, not that they don't exist at all. So, honestly, that's what they should have fracken said. I discuss an early example of this in Sense and Goodness Without God index for common parlance regarding of life force. The traditional and common superstition that this is some force that hovers around living things like a magnetic field and that has powers conveying vitality is indeed false. But what the phrase life force was keying on, what people actually observe when saying it is present or absent, does exist, a certain emergent behavior of active metabolic systems defining life versus non-life or even death. We have simply explained that entirely now as a system of chemical and electrical interactions sustained by a material platform, usually consisting of genes and cells, which reduce to atoms, arranged in a certain way. There is no force or field corresponding. But the physical system can generate standard physical forces, and thus make decisions, move around, in a word, live. Vitality is real. It does exist. It just isn't a separate physical substance or fundamental force. Just as heat is real, yet isn't a distinct substance as once we thought, but the emergent effect of a complex system of physical causes among things none of which by itself is heat or even meaningfully hot. That still doesn't mean we can say heat doesn't exist. We just have a better idea now of what it is and what causes it. The semantics of illusionism. So when philosophers talk about consciousness not existing or being only an illusion, I think this is a semantic mistake. Which is a common error in academic philosophy these days, do I think to the total abandonment of ordinary language philosophy as a trend without salvaging what it got right, just like the foolish abandonment of the entirety of logical positivism without, again, salvaging what it got right, one of many wrong moves the field has made of late. 
Though many of the propositions and insistences and conclusions of OLP were wrong, or at least wrong-headed, it had some key positions entirely correct. Among them, ordinary everyday language is fundamental to philosophical analysis and must always be attended to and not abandoned, not under any excuse. Yes, jargon and formalisms are useful. But if you cannot immediately tie them to how most people ordinarily speak and understand words, you have failed them, and thus failed one of the most essential goals of philosophy as an enterprise. Accordingly, one should never write a whole, lengthy paper about how consciousness is an illusion and never qualify that by explaining that this does not mean to say consciousness doesn't exist. Because an ordinary language philosopher doing their job would recognize that in popular colloquial English it's an illusion and it doesn't exist in most contexts mean the same thing, and therefore to not qualify contextually what you mean is to forget how ordinary English works and therefore cause all manner of ubiquitous misunderstanding. That even professional philosophers are thereby confused by it only makes the point worse, as you can't then retreat behind fuck ordinary people, I only care about what the ivory tower thinks either. Because, well, even the ivory tower is failing to get your point. And that's on you, buddy. Attend to plain language. That will correct most of this. Yes, many people, lay and expert, are also bad at language and fail to understand even clear sentences in English, but you can't fix every problem in the world by speaking clearly. So here's the antidote. Consciousness is certainly an illusion, in the same way colors and mirages are illusions. But illusions still exist. To confuse that mirage is an illusion with that mirage doesn't exist is a semantic error that, inexplicably, even many expert philosophers are making here. A mirage exists. Indeed, it even physically exists outside the mind, it's refracted light on a radiated heat differential, forming a pattern similar to reflections from water. It just isn't water. The illusion is as to what it is, not that it exists. Colors are a good example, nothing in the world has a color. Nothing is red or green. Our brains made that up as a way to represent a much more complicated fact, patterns of photon frequency reflections and refractions and the like, in a simple enough way to make practical use of. But that does not mean colors don't exist. They are illusions, yes. We are being tricked into thinking things in the world have those colors, and it took a centuries of sophisticated science to discover that fact. Even Newton believed colors were things in the world that light was colored. But it was later shown that light is just photons vibrating at certain frequencies, color is then manufactured in the brain as a fiction to represent that. But this still means colors are real, the brain really is inventing them, you really are experiencing them. That is in fact the whole point of colors, if they didn't exist, we couldn't make use of them in the way we do. Consciousness is an illusion in the same sense, it is a model our brains build of what's going on in our brain, and in so doing it might invent some things that serve roles as colors do, things that don't exist apart from the model or the system building it, but that are useful for representing something else that does exist, neurons, information processing, and the like. For example, our sense of time is actually constructed out of 1-10th to 1-20th second moments, such that we are tricked by film reels into not seeing the walls on each cell of film and instead seeing continuous motion. Illusion, but still a real thing that's happening. And indeed, here the illusion is obviously intentional. We are supposed to understand continuous motion is occurring, even though it isn't. That's the point of setting film frame rates at 1 slash 24 th a second. So, yes, that we are seeing continuous motion when we watch a movie or TV show is an illusion. But the illusion itself remains real, it is actually happening, we are actually experiencing it, and that is the entire point of creating the illusion. To borrow Dennett's analogy, that the magician just sawed a woman in half is an illusion, yes, but there are still a saw and two boxes, one with a woman's head popping out, and another with feet, peculiarly resembling hers. There is still something that exists here. It just isn't what we are meant to believe is there. I think the best way to translate what Dennett and the like are trying to say that doesn't make a hash of the English language is that anything experienced in our mind does indeed exist, but as a trick our brain pulls on us, and not some sort of platonic second substance we have to account for with some weird ontology. Tricks still exist though. So to say it is a trick is not, in ordinary language, to say it doesn't exist. That would be a semantic mistake. And anyone making that mistake easy to make, or outright making it, is failing at philosophy. To be fair, Dennett is not the worst offender here, he just buries this information in hundreds of words that beat around without ever clearly getting to this crucial point that illusions still exist, they are still real, as illusions. And indeed, that is what he is trying to explain, how qualia, the philosopher's catch-all word for all the particular possibles of experience, from colors, to sounds to smells to feelings and thoughts and the whole show, come to exist. They exist as illusions. Like the two boxes, one with a smiling assistant, peeking out, the other with some mannequin feet, wearing her same shoes, and a saw in between. To think anything more has happened is like thinking this woman was just actually cut in half, or that some magical quantum portal must connect the two boxes. Instead, those are dumb theories. Likewise, most attempts at explaining consciousness. One way to frame this in a way that's more helpful than you might be encountering is to think of qualia in the context of the p-zombie problem. A p-zombie is a philosophical zombie, a conceptual entity wherein we have an exact copy of you, exact same brain, down to every exact same synapse and neural behavior, same chemical interactions, same electrical signals, that differs from you in only one respect, they don't experience qualia. So, for example, they can discriminate, even name and identify, colors exactly as you do, but they don't experience colors. They have no idea what red looks like. They experience nothing. They just exhibit the requisite knowledge and behavior. The attempt to insist qualia are independently real, and not a trick or illusion, has indeed been to posit a p-zombie. But this actually fails to work as they want, in fact, their own thought experiment verifies everything Dennett is saying. I've already explained this in detail, before in my section on zombies in Unhosing Thought Experiments, which gives many more examples of academic philosophers making similar semantic mistakes as I am fixing here, illustrating the problem is endemic and not just particular to this topic. Indeed, note how the entire free will debate can be characterized as deriving without remainder from a singular semantic mistake of similar kind, see why syllogisms usually suck, free will addition and free will. In the real world, and why it matters. 
TL, DR, to make it work as described, the P zombie would have to either lie when asked if it experiences qualia, which would be a difference of behavior, with observably different brain functions, ruling it out as a P zombie, or actually sincerely believe it is seeing qualia when it is not, since reporting it does not, would be a difference of behavior again, with observably different brain functions, again ruling it out as a P zombie. But what's the difference between merely believing you are experiencing qualia, and actually experiencing qualia? Then it is saying there is no difference, so there is nothing more left to explain. This is not actually saying qualia, the experiences themselves, don't exist, it is rather saying that some other thing, let's call it qualia, the David Chalmers style, second substance, thingamawats that everyone thinks is some extra thing we have yet to explain, doesn't exist. There are no qualia. There are only qualia. Just as there is no phlogiston, and no fundamental life force, and no libertarian free will, and no platonic forms, and so on and on. And those saying this are right. All evidence does point to this. Qualia is an epicycle, angels pushing the planets. We have no need of that hypothesis. Qualia as useful illusion is the simplest explanation that fits all the facts, and thus indeed, as Dennett says, should therefore be the default, and the burden then put on qualia advocates to prove their harebrained thing even exists. But one should not confuse that for saying qualia don't exist. Because illusions still exist, and something still is creating them. The ontology of consciousness. The objection is usually made that this can't be true. Consciousness can't be an illusion, because all these other illusions, colors, etc., are being presented to someone, illusions still require an observer. That someone can't themselves be an illusion. But the fact that that isn't true is precisely Dennett's point. There is no literal someone to whom things are being presented. There is no little homunculus inside you watching your thoughts like a theater. That you feel like there is is the illusion. But that feeling, the experiencing of things in that way, remains real. It's actually happening. Consciousness thus exists. It just isn't the thing you thought it was. Like all those other things we had mistaken ideas about, from heat to life force, to free will, to abstract objects and beliefs and propositional knowledge and beyond. Consciousness is a construct, a computational model, and as such, it is an illusion of something else. For example, that you are a single unified person observing all things from a single Cartesian point. That's fake. Useful. But fake. You are actually spread out over dozens of disparate information processing systems and data storage registers across your brain that don't operate in perfect simultaneity, much less exist at a single point or even have a common purpose. And qualia, the entire content of consciousness, from colors to feelings to thoughts, don't exist outside your mere belief that they do. They are not located at any point in space-time, they have no mass or energy, they are not made of anything. They simply are what it is to process information a certain way. It feels like it feels, and that's it. There is no more substance to it. Hence, this is all an illusion insofar as this computation tricks us into thinking there is more to it than that, see the bogus idea of the bogus mysteries of consciousness. For example, that colors exist outside our mind, they don't. Or that emotions are something more than the product of independent information processing neural circuits separated from much of the rest of what constitutes us, they aren't. And so on. Even the sense that our mind could exist without the brain, that it could leave the body and continue working. Nope. That's an illusion. Our brain is tricking itself into thinking that's the case, by creating the illusion of the singular, disembodied person watching it all. We experience consciousness this way, because our brain's computations make us think we do. And for no other reason. So when someone says, but illusions require an observer, this is to conflate observer with consciousness of observing. My computer's motion sensing system is an observer of events in my room, it is not conscious. Even worms and robots count as observers. We are not here trying to explain observers. We are here trying to explain consciousness of being an observer, the what it is like aspect of it, hence, qualia, which includes emotions and thoughts, everything experiency, not just sensory perceptions. There is no person inside my computer observing me move across the room, yet it is observing me cross the room. There is no person inside a fly observing a light across the way, yet it is observing a light across the way. The peculiar thing is not there are observers. The peculiar thing is why it feels the way it does to be an observer. In humans, a distinct part of that is a self-model, our brains build a model of a unified system of goals and perspectives, which represents the brain as a whole being an observer. That is made up. Useful. But made up. We feel like this is the case, because our brains compute that it is the case. For example, in our brains we have separate systems processing sound and vision, but our brains then unify them into a single integrated model. That integration is a construct, it does not exist apart from the information processing that produces it. More importantly, as science has conclusively proved by now, it does not exist in some separate place all its own, there is no point in the brain where we can say the unification occurs there. The unification is occurring across the whole brain. Likewise, all your thoughts, emotions, motivations, your brain invents a coherent model of all those disparate things and integrates it into the sensory field produced, making you feel like there is a single point observer watching it all. That's fake. Useful but fake. No such single point observer exists in the brain. There is no place you can point to. It's an output spanning multiple brain systems, a perspective that the brain as a whole has stitched together, manufactured, as a useful fiction, see the mind is a process, not an object, on not understanding mind-brain physicalism. Indeed, we know it takes about half a second to process this fiction, hence, fact is, we already made a decision and processed the why of it half a second before we become aware that we made that decision and why. We as in the whole of us, our memories, reasoning, character, personality, skills, attitudes, values, etc., still made that decision, and usually indeed for the very reasoning we then become conscious of. But our awareness of that, as a unified and coherent model of what just happened, is a computed product of the brain, one that as such took it time to complete and render. But you're saying it didn't render it to anyone. No. Who it rendered to is you, the brain as a whole. The feeling of what this is like, of sitting at the center watching it all, like someone in the audience separate from it, is all a construct, a useful fiction. The experience is the illusion. 
not what it is an experience of. That's real. No one actually means to say consciousness is just our brain making everything up all willy-nilly. There is a real you with real thoughts and feelings and real perceptions. It's just how it is presented, what it feels like, that is fictional. And the illusion, too, is also real. No one is actually intending to say the illusion doesn't exist either. You really are feeling like that. It's just that we don't require anything more to explain that than that you believe you are. And we don't require anything more to explain that than that your brain has computed you are. That's done its point. There is no extra something required. That computed belief is all there is. Conclusion Again to be clear, as Dennett sometimes is not, to call all this a fiction is not to say that its content, what it represents, is false or that its reference don't exist. There is a brain, it shares a volume in your head, it occupies and operates one and only one body, and it's thinking and evaluating, and moving around in a world arranged more or less like you think it is. So to simulate this with a fiction of a unified perspective, a singular observer, to whom everything seems presented, is not wholly inaccurate. But it does mislead in respect to its core attribute, which is why so many philosophers, and so many more lay people, still have confused themselves into thinking qualia must be some magical second substance and consciousness some real central entity that merely sits aside and observes what the brain presents it, and then gives it instructions. Thus the illusion of consciousness has misled us into thinking there must be something more to make this possible, that there must be some extra separate entity to whom this is all presented. But that's precisely the illusion being created. It isn't what's actually happening. This is still a useful illusion, though, because every aspect of it corresponds to something true about you and the world. Just like colors, they are fictions, but useful because our brain attempts to correlate them with real information about the external world. They are simply a convenient way to represent and analyze information. The information is still real. What it corresponds to is still real. And what it feels like a computed is still real. The room you are in is laid out as you think, the objects in it really are where you think, and so on. The colors, the representation of objects as solid, these are fictions your brain uses to model all these things. And this can mislead you, as it did almost all humanity until relatively recently, into thinking objects in the world really look like that, really have colors, rather than only reflecting or refracting electromagnetic field quanta, really are solid, rather than almost entirely empty space, and so on. But even once we know that, it's still all usable data about real things. Thanks to the repulsion of the electromagnetic force, we really can't walk through objects we perceive as solid, visible light photons really aren't passing through them, and so on. So calling colors an illusion, fictions invented by our brain, is not saying they don't exist, nor even that they don't correspond to any real thing. Hence, likewise, the Cartesian theater illusion does represent some key information correctly, and only fabricates the theater perspective so as to compute all that information conveniently. You are a single brain in a single body, and thus all parts of you do share some common interests and goals, and organizing those into a singular focusable purpose is useful in precisely all the ways we observe it to be. Obviously. Just look at everything we can and have accomplished with this ability, as persons and a people. This illusion continues to create information as well, as the more you think about yourself and your life a certain way, the more this becomes narrative memory stored in the brain and thus becomes even more a part of you. You are thus not a random jumble of reactions, feelings, perceptions, and desires. You, as a definable person, an individual, a self, do indeed exist, indeed your brain has been building this personal identity since birth. You exist as all the stored information about you in your brain, and its physical neural interconnections, and you get to experience informational reports about you, what you, as in your brain, are thinking, seeing, feeling, deciding, as your brain computes them, and those computed outputs do indeed become inputs in future reasoning and thinking and causal development of you as a person. Thus all of this exists. It just doesn't exist as what it superficially seems or feels like, just as colors do not. But just as colors are useful and represent real things apart from them, so is your conscious self-model, your experience of what it is like to be you. His position is that there is no difference between the object and subject and therefore can be no such relation, and thus qualia cannot be some separate thing. To process information a certain way simply is to experience it a certain way. Qualia are never actually separate from their observer. Experiencing them simply and only is what it is to be a certain kind of observer. This is not saying no one experiences this and therefore qualia don't exist in any sense whatever. He only ever says they don't exist as some separate thing from the state of being someone experiencing them. Likewise, I see a particular shade of red and I see nothing. This does mean there must be something physically different about the neural circuitry that produce that experience, that differs from green or other shades of red or sound or smell or different emotions, and so on, and that difference must fully explain the specifics of their differences. This is what philosophers resistant to the conclusion get hung up on, they can't imagine what that could be, so they conclude it can't be. Which is a basic fallacy of lack of imagination. Just like we can't imagine what would make quantum mechanics true or we can't imagine how relativity and quantum mechanics could both be true at the same time, where obviously if we could imagine it, we'd have solved those scientific problems by now, likewise qualia. So I don't see any evidential weight in we can't think of how. We expect we can't think of the how of anything until we've actually figured it out. So this really just becomes a tautological description of the frontiers of science. Meanwhile, as I explained in mind, the circumstantial evidence makes quite clear it's going to be some physical explanation anyway, because we have already explained so much that people thought couldn't be explained about human experience and thought with entirely physical facts and models. So the trend line is clear. We also know why we haven't gotten there yet. Because we need certain fundamentals sorted before we can even begin to formulate testable hypotheses, e.g. we need accurate synaptic and neuronal IO maps of human, or at least mammalian, brains to even know what the physical differences in all these circuits actually are. And we are nowhere near even that rudimentary step. One thing we will then get to be able to do is say whether there are finite qualia in a domain or infinite, e.g. once we know what makes the physical difference between color and sound circuits and between one color and another, we will know if there are infinitely many color circuits possible or a finite number owing to the limits of the IP geometry. 
But that's still another whole step away from answering a question like why does the specific information processing feel like smelling cinnamon, for example? There is a lot more science to be done to get there. But this is not a sound argument against their being fully in accord with physicalism. All signs point toward it being so. And no alternative even contains a competing explanation anyway. No form of substance dualism gives any intelligible reason why cinnamon smells like cinnamon either. I can't tell, but if that's what's happening, then I should note that my moral system is not dependent on qualia, but on consciousness, the awareness and understanding of things. I do happen to believe these are logically inseparable, but we haven't formally proved that yet, so it is at least conceptually possible they are separable and there could have been a world without qualia, but with conscious understanding and satisfaction and dissatisfaction states and the like. If such a world exists, my moral theory would still follow there. Because it follows from the ability to comprehend and care about things. If no such ability exists, neither could any moral propositions be true. Not at all. Emergent properties are real properties and have real effects on the world, which could thus include effects on what is morally true or not. And imperfect modeling is merely an epistemic issue, the same as all moral theories must cope with, and indeed all knowledge of anything whatever. And degrees of consciousness are an ontological fact, and different physical facts should be expected to make differences in moral facts, not the other way around. We actually can objectively define the difference between a real experience and a hallucinated one. In a real experience, the construct is built out of, and trying to reliably interpret, actual sensory data, and a hallucinated experience is when that happens without actual sensory data. So turn this onto the mind itself, would it make sense to say there is a difference between constructing a self-absent any relevant data, and making a good effort at constructing one out of real data? Here it becomes clear consciousness cannot be a hallucination, because it is literally a construct from real data, that's the only way it can even exist. This is why anything you ask about yourself is usually, not always, but more often than not, true. Real memories. Real desires. Real point of view, both in its vantage and its blinds. Even the stuff that is more frequently false than the rest, like beliefs about your character or abilities, is still being built out of real data, your computer is just drawing the wrong conclusions from that data. When someone completely fantasizes a self, we get personal delusions, I am Napoleon, which we recognize as mental illness and not the normal mode of anyone's brain. Everyone else has the ability to fact-check and correct towards actual their beliefs about themselves, and thus become more self-aware and more self-actualized. That that is possible, and that there is a difference between being that and not, proves consciousness is real and thus not a hallucination. But it is still an illusion in various respects. The bogus idea of the bogus mysteries of consciousness. Say what now? First, what are qualia? If you're new to the idea, qualia means the qualitative properties of human experience. It's a catch-all term for all the features unique to conscious experience, the what it is like to be seeing the color red or hearing a bass drum beat or smelling cinnamon or feeling angry. Explaining why qualia exist and are the way they are is called the hard problem of consciousness because it's really the last frontier of brain science, a question we haven't yet resolved even hypothetically, in contrast to the other three unsolved frontiers of science, the origin of life, the origin of the universe, and the fundamental explanation of the standard model of particle physics, which all have fairly good hypotheses already on the table. Yes, the explanation for qualia most likely does have something to do with the inevitable physical effects of information processing. All evidence so far is converging on no other conclusion. But that still leaves us ignorant of a lot of the details. This is mainly because we can't access the information we need to answer this question. For example, to tell what actually is causally different between a neural synaptic circuit whose activation causes us to smell cinnamon rather than oranges, or see red or hear violins or feel ennui, we need resolutions of brain anatomy far beyond any present technology. The mere arrangement of synapses won't be enough even, yet we don't even have that, and since the IO signal for any neuron is determined by something inside the neuron, such as perhaps methyl groups attached to the nuclear DNA of the cell, we'd need to be able to make a map even of that, for every single cell in the brain, which is far beyond any present physical capability. AI research could get there sooner, if somehow they achieve general AI, and can ask it about its personal phenomenology, but that's just another technological capability we presently don't have. In any event, if you want to catch up on the history of this problem and its current state of play, see the entries in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And to catch up on where I land on this subject, see the mind is a process not an object, as well as the relevant sections of how my philosophy would solve the unsolved problems and how I'd answer the fill paper survey. What is Hacker on about? What Hacker argues is not even quite the same thing as what so-called eliminativists argue. They don't really argue qualia don't exist, but that they don't exist in the sense supposedly everyone assumes. Neither Paul and Patricia Chichland nor Daniel Dennett have actually argued qualia don't exist in any sense at all. Which is a problem I have with eliminativists generally, they only confuse people with semantic games. Dennett proposes we must abandon qualia by providing alternative explanations for the phenomena that qualia are evoked to explain. But the phenomena to be explained are the qualia. Dennett thus confuses causal theories of qualia with the qualia themselves. The Chichlands make the same mistake. Once you correct their mistake, we're back at square one, we have some distinctive phenomena we have to explain, and we have not yet fully explained them. It does not matter what you call those phenomena. You can't change what a thing is by changing what you call it. Hacker doesn't make this mistake, because in those other cases, such as the Chechlands and Dennett, their actual explanations are coherent enough to actually disentangle what they are trying to say in different words. For example, Dennett ultimately gets around to admitting there are phenomena to explain, and he attempts an explanation of them. Hacker does neither. As such, I suspect Hacker has simply naively misunderstood eliminativists, and gone off on an immature brag fest denouncing the stupidity of anyone who still thinks there are any phenomena to explain. Dennett and the Chechlands don't do that. They admit there is something to explain, and try to explain it, though what they provide is really a meta-explanation, which in each case reduces to the same thing, they propose qualia are an illusion, they are simply what it is to believe you are experiencing qualia. 
In other words, qualia are not an extra something that explain anything, they are, rather, the inevitable consequence of certain forms of information processing. I concur. I just don't think it's helpful to frame that as saying qualia don't exist. That's rather like realizing when I see a mirage of water on the horizon, I know that that water doesn't exist, and then concluding the mirage doesn't exist. That's to confuse explanandum with explainants. Why you can't hide from this? No matter what word games you play, you still have to explain why cinnamon doesn't smell like oranges, why activating one neural circuit causes you to experience a smell at all and not hear a bass drum or see the color red or feel disgust, and vice versa, or any other conceivable thing instead, and why any of this happens at all. We will know what it is like to process information without any of this phenomena, we call it our subconscious. So what makes the difference between just walking the life running purely on subconscious processes, and instead experiencing all these bizarre, and bizarrely specific, phenomena? What makes the difference between experiencing something as a smell, and experiencing it as a color? Or a sound? Or an emotion? Or anything else other than any of these things? Why, in other words, do smells or colors or sounds even exist at all? And we don't mean by this the biomechanics of our sensory systems. When we ask what makes the difference between cinnamon smelling like cinnamon and not oranges, we don't mean what has to be different about the molecular receptors in the nose that distinguish between these two odors, those don't have anything whatever to do with what things smell like. No matter what molecule stimulates a certain neural tract in the nose, that's just a binary signal, on or off, that flows into the brain. At best, perhaps, it has a quantity scale. But there's nothing qualitative about it. That wire could go anywhere. It could go to the circuit that makes you see red, rather than smell anything, much less some particular thing. And for some people, it does, synesthesia is a thing. So why are only some people synesthetes? Qualia are in fact undeniables. They therefore cannot not exist. The probability is literally zero. And that's saying something, because almost nothing has a truly zero probability. But qualia are in fact the one and only thing that does. Because it is literally 100% impossible that I am experiencing a white field with black markings inside it right now is false, that it isn't happening and thus doesn't exist. That I am seeing letters on a computer screen as I type can be in doubt, maybe I'm hallucinating or dreaming this, maybe I am mistaken about what the sensory signals my brain is interpreting as letters on a computer screen actually signify, and so on. But that I am experiencing seeing letters on a computer screen is impossible to doubt. And why that is has to be explained. Yes, qualia are fictional, our brain invents them to demarcate and navigate information, and yes, their existence will have something to do with information processing. Because we know if you remove or numb the pertinent information processing circuit that generates any given experience, you remove the experience. And you can even cause the experience to occur by simply sticking a wire into the pertinent circuit and shocking it. So we know this is simply something that circuit does, and does differently than a circuit that doesn't generate any phenomenological experience, as most circuits in our brain don't, or that generates a different one than this, as all the remaining circuits in our brain do. What makes it cinnamon circuit because that experience and not some other, or none at all? This is the mystery of consciousness that Hacker daftly claims is bogus. But it's Hacker's claim that's bogus. Hacker's catastrophic derail. One thing that often throws everyone off, including the eliminativists, is the persistent yet completely unnecessary assumption that qualia are things. That they are objects, entities, evoking wonder at what mass or charge they have or whether we can bottle them. That would be as mistaken as thinking we can capture running down the street or voting in an election in a bottle and weigh it on a scale. Those are not things, they are events. And like them, qualia are events, not things, I fully explicate this point in my article, the mind is a process not an object. Thus qualia don't explain things, they are the thing to be explained. And they don't exist separately from the physical process underlying them, they are the physical process underlying them. So the question is what is different about those physical processes, and other physical processes, which don't generate such phenomena? That is exactly identical to the question of what causes those events of experience to occur, and to have the qualities they do, rather than others instead. And this is the hard problem of consciousness. It is not unsolvable, we know what we need to do to get at the answer, we just don't have the technology to get at it yet, nor is its being mysterious evidence against physicalism. Physicalism poses no difficulty for explaining what events are and why they occur. But Hacker ignores all that and launches his bizarre essay with the incredible declaration that there is nothing mysterious or arcane about consciousness, despite all actual experts the world over, from brain scientists to philosophers, concurring that there is. Indeed Hacker even slags off eliminativists in his first paragraph, noting that Daniel Dennett himself has said that consciousness is the most mysterious feature of our minds, and so Dennett, too, is among all the rest of the world's experts who should know better. Hacker himself is a philosopher of relevant pedigree, so really, it is he who should know better. I just laid out what the mystery of consciousness is, and it is very real, and indeed remains very much a mystery. Maybe not as much a mystery as why America elected Donald Trump to be their president or why ketchup-flavored ice cream is a thing. But some matter of mystery all the same. So how does Hacker try to argue that it isn't a mystery? That there isn't anything about it to explain? Mostly Hacker argues by vacuous mockery. It takes quite a lot of reading to ever even discern an actual argument in anything he says. Indeed, the first time we get to anything even close to an argument is a sarcastic remark that There is something which it is like for you to believe that 25 times 25 is equal to 625, which is different from what it is like for you to believe that 25 times 25 is equal to 624. There is something it is like for you to intend to retire at 11.30, which is different from what it is like for you to intend to get up at 7.00. These are distinct qualia. This isn't, of course, an argument at all. He does not draw any conclusions or inferences from this declaration. He seems to imply that it is ridiculous and that it's being ridiculous somehow means qualia don't exist. But I can't fathom how a serious philosopher could think that wasn't bollocks. These qualia don't exist, therefore none do is a shit argument. It's just all the worse that arguments to the ridiculous are usually already shit arguments. 
they typically just reify the fallacy of argument from lack of imagination. To simply presume there is no qualitative difference between experiencing the conceptual distinctions he lists here is, in other words, a circular argument. And circular arguments are shit arguments. The rest of us aren't the stupid. Belief means confidence, and we all know confidence feels different than the lack of it. Whereas if there is anyone out there who can experience the difference between 624 and 625 as quantities, that logically entails that for them, there is something experientially different between them. And that's exactly what the word qualia means. Most of us, however, do not qualitatively experience any difference between such abstract numbers as 624 and 625. We comprehend them in a computational sense, absent any unique qualia. We generally have to work out in what way they differ, we don't experience it directly, the way we do the difference between 2 and 3, which are quantities we can directly apprehend and experience. And to feel the difference between those quantities we don't even have to be the synesthete to whom chicken tastes like 3 points, but we could be, and how would Hacker explain that? But larger numbers, like 624 and 625? Those simply don't feel any different to us except in fragmentary ways. We can feel that one of those quantities has one more than the other, but so do lots of other quantities, that both are in the hundreds, but so are lots of quantities, and we experience distinct features of the Arabic shape of the component numerals, but those numerals, and hence the attendant qualia, attached to lots of other numbers, and so on. But that's it. And that's what we need to explain. By contrast, we can be fairly confident my desktop computer experiences none of these things. So why do I? And why do they feel like that, and not like something else? Of course, to some people, they do. The most common form of synesthesia is to experience color qualia in conjunction with various numbers. That hacker doesn't know this would suggest he is too science illiterate to have any opinion on this topic worth consulting. Indeed, in accord with his ignorance, perhaps hacker might ignorantly blather on about how we could possibly know my desktop computer doesn't experience these things as I do, at which he should be instructed to read up on the science of comparative neuroanatomy. My desktop computer has none of the corresponding hardware we know my brain requires to experience those things. We know a computer's entire contents, and nowhere in that inventory is any experiential circuitry analogous to ours. Yet my computer can agilely handle the conceptual content of these numbers through countless renderings and computations. Perhaps that does feel like something to it, but it won't be at all like what it feels like to me. Our phenomenological circuitry is too radically different. My computer's phenomenology couldn't even be identical to that of a flatworm, and yet is surely far more distant from mine than a worm's. And unless hacker is going to profess a belief in magic, he cannot propose an effect can exist without a necessary and sufficient cause. So now I am halfway through hacker's essay and have yet to encounter a single argument, apart from this garbage, which is the mere fragment of a possible argument, and that argument is trash. Demystifier, IL-7 in the second half of his essay Hacker makes the whole world facepalm when he backtracks from the stupid idea he's been uselessly pushing for hundreds of words now by declaring there is ignorance, but nothing mysterious. Someone ship him a dictionary. Those mean the same thing. When Dennett says the question of how the human brain generates the particular phenomenal experience that it does, he simply means we do not know how it does that. It's a mystery. Have I really been duped into reading a thousands word long equivocation fallacy? Is Hacker that shitty a philosopher? I tell him it's time for him to retire, but I see that he already has. Maybe he should stick to fishing. Or knitting. That's a good hobby. But it's worse than that. When Hacker gets to trying to explain how there is no mystery to explain, he actually reverts back to claiming we are not ignorant of how consciousness works. So which is it? Never mind. Here he declares the question of what perceptual consciousness is first trivial, because obviously it has survival advantages. This is where he jumps the shark, revealing he doesn't know what he is talking about. When scientists ask why qualitative experience evolved, they are not asking why the conceptual processing of perception or thought evolved, they already know why that's useful. The mystery is not why our brains can do those things, for example, locate and react to movement in our peripheral perception. The mystery is why our brain can't just do that as blindly as it does everything else, why does it have to experience doing it? We don't need colors. So why does our brain invent red when we could just simply respond to different wavelengths of light automatically? We don't need to experience seeing anything to recognize something is there and is reflecting different wavelengths of light than something next to it, for example. So why does our brain bother coloring that in? Much less with specifically that color. Remember, red does not exist. Nothing outside our brain has any color. Redness is a fiction our brains made up to represent certain patterns of photon wavelengths. Why? And remember, that's both senses of why, why did it do that at all? And why did it do it in that specific way? Why are red things red and not blue? Why are they red and not some shade or pattern of gray? Why not some other completely alien color? What is it about the circuit that colors in parts of our visual field with red that is different from the circuit that colors it blue? And why does that physical difference in those circuits produce exactly that difference in color experience? This is what scientists are talking about when they say they don't know why our brains evolved to do this, nor how any neural circuit even can do this. Hacker seems to not know this. He seems to think scientists are confused about why wavelength discrimination is useful, but my computer can do that, and it needs no conscious experience to reap every resulting benefit. So what use is the experiential aspect of wavelength discrimination? And what use is that specific kind of experiential discrimination? Colors instead of shades of gray, those color assignments instead of some others, and so on, neither is explained yet, by evolutionary biology or neurophysics. We have ideas. But Hacker seems not to know that either. He acts like all scientists and philosophers have done is throw up their hands and propose nothing. In fact, they've been busy proposing a lot of good leads for answering these questions. Hacker seems not to know any. He can cherry-pick a Dennett quote, but does not appear to have ever read him. Take Hacker's example of pain. He claims consciousness of increasing pain is an incentive to decrease stress on an injury. But that utterly fails as an explanation. 
All we need is the behavioral response to stimuli effect. We do not have to feel pain at all. The useful behaviors hacker refers to can be entirely programmed without it. So why are we programmed with it? What is pain for? The question is not, what are aversive stimuli for? If we just reflexively favored a wounded limb, no one would be mystified. But we don't do that. Instead, we have an elaborate phenomenology of pain, a completely unnecessary extra step, and one most annoying. Why? We can tell this evolved early. Comparative neuroanatomy shows that experiential pain as a mechanism is an attribute of neural systems going pretty far back, at least as far back as insects. By contrast, similar reactive systems in single-celled and simple multi-celled organisms, and plants, lack any of that computational architecture. They don't need it. So why do animals? We can even today build injury-favoring robots without any of that phenomenological architecture. So why did evolution produce it? More importantly, how did evolution produce it? After all, we do not know how to program a robot or a computer to feel pain. Why? This is the mystery that completely eludes Hacker, because he apparently read nothing on this subject, and knows nothing about the actual debates and concerns of real experts in it. He just pontificated a drunk uncle's essay from the armchair, harumphing at something he doesn't even understand, and has made no effort to. This is annoying. How does one solve these mysteries? When Hacker makes hopelessly naive declarations like, effective consciousness enables us to reflect on our moods and emotions, and to bring them under rational control in a manner unavailable to other animals, he is the one throwing up his hands and giving up. He is basically just covertly admitting he has no explanation for why we need effective consciousness to do this. He is likewise declaring, we have no need of knowing how evolution could have produced such a remarkable feature, even were it needed. Even computationally. Much less biologically. This is almost as anti-scientific a behavior you could ever expect from a purported philosopher. We don't know how a computational process can produce an effective consciousness to use in this way. That is the primary mystery of consciousness. Nor do we know why our brains, arranged as they are, generate the particular kind of effective consciousness we experience, why our emotions feel the way they do and not like something else. That is the secondary mystery of consciousness. Only then do we rank the remaining mystery of consciousness, which is why evolution would have brought us down that road of DNA mutations toward developing an organ capable of any of that, rather than achieving the same goals in other, less mysterious ways, like simply making thought more rational, no need for any phenomenology of emotion in the first place. Unlike Hacker, I acknowledge these are serious questions that need serious answers. Not armchair poo-pooing. Only a fool would think these questions can be ignored. And they haven't been. Following Dennett, the Chechlins, and others, I know, unlike Hacker, that the most promising research program here is in the direction of integrated information processing. At a certain level of complexity, virtual world building becomes inseparably phenomenological. In other words, you can't have a complex integrated perceptual system that doesn't eventuate a phenomenology, or what it is like to be navigating that virtual perceptual space. In other words, philosophical zombies are logically impossible. A conclusion evidently unknown to Hacker, who evidently has never actually read anything on this. This is, on present evidence, the most likely solution to the primary mystery of consciousness. From that it then follows the answer to the secondary and tertiary mysteries will be one of mechanism, eventually we will be able to map and diagram the specific neural circuits causally sufficient and necessary for generating every unique quaily, and we will then be able to see what the physical difference is between a circuit that generates a scent and a circuit that generates a color, or a circuit that generates no quaily at all, and then what the physical difference is between a circuit that generates the color red and a circuit that generates the color blue, and we will then be able to deduce all logically possible color circuits, and be able to begin discovering, and possibly even predicting, what colors any given circuit will generate and why. Likewise sense, feelings, and the like. I do not think we will be able to predict all phenomenology independent of experiencing it ourselves. I suspect we would have to integrate a color circuit into or perceptual system to experience the color it produces. You have to be the process to know what it is like to be, but we will be able to categorize them. At a mere glance, we will be able to predict whether a circuit so installed would make us see a color or smell an odor or feel a feeling, for example. And with all that information, we will be able to look at the evolutionary history of every component, all the way back to its most primitive known ancestor, and thereby answer the question of why evolution favored that route for that circuit, while favoring the development of non-conscious circuitry for other functions and systems in the brain. I can say that, at this point, I suspect what we will find is that phenomenology-driven pathways are more computationally simple to develop for the complex purposes they serve. We may find, for example, that it is possible to design a consciousness circuit that does not feel pain but reacts in every way identically to the ways pain is meant to benefit its experiencer, but that the requisite programming is too irreducibly complex to arrive at blindly by stepwise mutation and natural selection. The pathway of co-opting a phenomenological feedback loop was probably easier and thus more likely to be hit upon by any evolutionary process. Conclusion after pointless drunk uncle rambling, completely missing the point, understanding nothing, and developing no cogent theory of why or how a completely natural, physical world can be compatible with experiential consciousness, Hacker eventually resorts to the idiotic declaration that the world does not contain conscious states and events, but rather it contains sentient creatures like us who are conscious, or unconscious, and are conscious of various things. Those are the same goddamn things. There is no such thing as a sentient creature without conscious states and events. There is no such thing as being conscious and there being no events or states of consciousness. Hacker is literally writing contradictory nonsense. Hacker closes his essay with a dozen more nonsensical contradictory statements, like that one, which require no further parsing. The fact remains that there are indeed real mysteries of consciousness. There are phenomena we cannot yet and as yet have not explained. We don't know how a physical system can produce them, we have some ideas, but a long way to go to confirm them. We don't know why different physical systems produce certain phenomena and not others, we have some ideas, but a long way to go to confirm them. And we don't know how or why evolution ever got to or needed any of this to do any useful thing, we have some ideas, but a long way to go to confirm them. Hacker does not explain any of this away. 
He instead simply ignores what all those mysteries actually are. He pretends there is nothing to explain, and therefore we don't need to develop even the beginning of any answers to them, much less continue a major scientific research program to complete them. But we do. And we have. But dolts like Hacker want you to simply abandon all scientific and philosophical curiosity and responsibility and pretend there are no mysteries to solve about why we are the way we are and how the world has made that possible. Please. New Year's resolution. Don't be like him. But yes, one can distinguish between irreducible and reducible qualia. A color or smell is irreducible. The experience of a flower is not. Qualia are holistic, not atomistic. When you see a color field, it cannot be reduced to pixels of color. It is a singular experience. And the actual Lego blocks are the circuits that, when activated, generate that experience, but the experience and the event of that circuit's activation and integration into a complex virtual model are not separable entities. The qualia thus actually reduce to a physical system, in the same way that running down the street does. The phrase, components of a sensorium, may be closer to correct, although these components are again actual physical circuits, that could be swapped out with others, e.g. if we could rewire the relevant parts of your brain, yank out, say, the red circuit and replace it with a magenta circuit for example, or a small circuit instead of a color, and so on. Your reported experience would change, though you wouldn't remember what it was like to be integrated with the removed sensation circuit, because memory would require activation of that very circuit, and thus you could have a scenario where you have a false memory of having always, say, smelled cinnamon instead of saw red, and the only clue that this was a swap would be your separate narrative memory, that those memories used to be of a color, even, the color red, but you would understand. That only conceptually, you would have lost the ability to experience that color or remember what it was like. So the components again are still physical circuits. Each of which corresponds to a specific what it is like to run that circuit. And then we get to the fact that the what it is like varies as the circuit itself varies, both internally and in its integration with other circuits. That is likely due to hormonal changes with age. If you took the right hormone cocktail, you might recover the youth sensation. But that depends on how much the circuit itself has actually changed, as we learn, accumulate experience, integrate more circuitry, which is not correctable, except by super advanced technologies that current don't exist. Note that there are a lot of clues to the circuit board in what you are saying. It actually can't happen that you would remember things differently if the whole circuit changed, as then your memories would also change, as they need to be run on the same exact hardware. There is no separate set of circuits for running memories, only for storing them. And memories are not stored like a tape recorder. They are stored as a set of instructions for reactivating the sensory circuits that generated them in the first place. So if those changed, so will your memories. But the stored instructions might not have changed, and that is where you can recover sneak circuit information. For instance, narrative memory is different from sensory memory. So if you recorded a narrative description of a memory, and the sensory circuits that run that memory changed, you can detect incongruities between the narrative information and the sensory trace. But this ceases to work at a certain fundamental level, e.g. there is no way to record a narrative memory of what the color red is like, only that, for example, it is a color and thus should resemble other colors in dynamic properties. Of course, narrative memories can also change, our memory system is not entirely reliable, but that's a whole other problem. Another way you can detect changes is when there is an integrated experience, i.e. several qualia circuits operating, and only, say, one, but not all of them have changed. And yet another way is an intensity. As we age, memories, and experience generally, tends to decline in intensity, and this is usually a product of changing hormone balances. You can narratively record the fact of an experience being more intense, and even recover the qualia of what it is like to be intense as the circuits producing that idea still exist, so that when a memory or a repeated experience feels less intense, you can detect that that is the case, yet not fix it, you can't make it more intense by a thought, as that is a hardware problem, not a software problem. All of these things give us clues to how the brain is and isn't wired, and as we correlate such clues to physical structures and organization in the brain we get closer to honing in on how the brain is doing any of this. We have a long way to go, but so far, we have enough evidence to prove where the final flag will be planted. It will be some form of brain physicalism, having to do with integrated information processing. That's simply an amplitude change, more of the same rather than less. Like the difference between shining a bright light in your eye rather than a dull one. Only the intensity shift sometimes occurs at the hardware level, rather than the actual quantity of molecules striking the nose changing, though it could be that, as thermodynamics entails they will emit and expand and disperse and thus become more diffuse over time, the brain registers the intensity and then dials it down once it starts to assume this is a new baseline. Indeed, and note that that is a problem at the detector end, the cone cells in the eye, not in the perceptual end, the brain's qualia circuitry. You can still experience blue and green as well as ever, it's just your eyes are bad at reporting to your brain when you are supposed to, because some of the cones are wired to the wrong qualia circuits. This is how we know there must really be people with inverted qualia, they see red when you see green, and vice versa, if you have both known mutations for color blindness, all the cones are swapped to a different circuit, so the cones that detect what we call green light all wire into the circuit that generates an experience of redness, and vice versa. Dreaming is a random walk, i.e. your brain randomly fires and runs circuits, and practices integrating them creatively into a virtual reality, which happens to be necessary to skills acquisition, circuits recently used will get the most activation, and the brain uses that to practice at whatever it thinks you were doing, by throwing random variations at it. Needless to say, all sorts of strange things can happen when that occurs, as it is no longer constrained by actual sensory signals from the outside. First, this is the problem of not being able to see the machinery that produces the output, like someone trying to fathom how a clock works, but they have no idea of gears, much less what arrangement of gears would be necessary to produce that effect. All you see is the effect, the clock hands moving a certain way. This is why qualia cannot be studied solely from inside experience, you have to crack open the brain and look at the engine that is generating them. And we don't have the technology to do that yet. Second, qualia are not limited to irreducibles. What generates qualia is the integrated virtual model, a complex of experiences, circuits interacting. And I don't think it's possible, for example, to just see red. 
You have to experience it in some integrated way, as a field of red, for example, which entails activating other circuits having to do with topography and geometry, and as part of a narrative experience, for example, which involves qualia having to do with the passage of time, the thoughts racing through your head, and so on. Meditation, and certain drugs, can link with this process in various interesting ways, but I am not aware of anyone escaping the necessity of integrated circuit activation. Qualia can only be experienced in a collective integrated experience of them, not in isolation. This means most experience, though it will have analyzable components, this is a sensation of red, this is a sensation of passing time, this is a thought, this is a sensation of a geometric space, will always have unique or repeatable integrations that have their own what it is like. Because it's not just a bunch of isolated circuits. Those circuits activate together in countless arrangements of metacircuits. This may have more to do with how memories are reinforced and diminished by neural pathway building. Your brain has accumulated so much more wiring since then, that that old wiring has either been written over or buried beyond recovery within much more abundant and robust connections. I'm not sure what this means. But sensory signaling is not the same thing as qualia circuit activation, per the color blindness example, and qualia are experienced as complexes of experience rather than singularly alone, per above. That you can report changes in experience entails you have experiences, so that rules you out as a philosophical zombie. And if you suppose you are only falsely believing you are having experiences, that is exactly the Dennett theory of consciousness with which I concur, see my mirage analogy. All the things you just reported only reinforce, not diminish, the hard problem, why do you need any of those experiences, much less the changes in them, is this an accidental or a deliberate product of evolution, what generates those experiences, and why does it only generate those, and only then, and why do they change, and why does most of your brain keep functioning without generating any? These are all the hard problem. That problem thus doesn't go away. An illusion still exists. And in fact, undeniably exists. For example, that a mirage of water is not real, does not mean the mirage does not exist. It most definitely does, in fact, that you are seeing it, when you are seeing it, is literally undeniable. It's the water that doesn't exist, not the mirage. If you falsely believe you are seeing red, there is literally no logical difference between that and seeing red. In other words, that is what redness is, a present belief in the presence of a color. The only thing left to explain is why a certain circuit convinces you that you are seeing precisely that illusion and not some other, or none at all. Dennett discusses this extensively in his book Consciousness Explained, but IMO the very best article on it is Cottrell's Sniffing the Camembert, if you can find a copy of that, maybe through your local public library. Only at the same scale. A holistic understanding of a person does not contradict the fact that they are entirely reducible to atoms. The one is simply looking at the same thing on a different scale. Missing the forest for the trees in no way means there aren't both trees and a forest. Thus, a field of red is not reducible to pixels of the color red. It is a single indivisible spatial experience. But red is not the same as green. Or as a smell. Or a feeling. Etc. Thus my explanation of how qualia are atomizable only to a certain and limited extent. And even then probably indivisible, we know of no way to just experience the color red, it only ever gets experienced in an integrated model of multiple qualia, e.g. a geometric shape or space that is red, etc. That qualia change is simply a question of neuromechanics. It has nothing to do with whether qualia exist. It's rather a demonstration that qualia can only be experienced in an integrated model. No virtual model, no experience. The you are here is only ever realized virtually. After all, you exist even when not conscious of you, e.g. you don't cease to exist when asleep, all your memories, abilities, character traits, preferences, etc. remain present, intact, and correctly arranged. Thus a consciousness of you is not you, it's just a virtual model of you, that you use to study and understand things about yourself and so as to be able to relate that model to other models, of other people's minds, of the physical environment you are in, etc. But, you are here, is a physical fact, wherever your brain is, not a mental fact. Your ability to experience yourself is a mental fact. And that requires computation. The one thing we know for certain about blindsight, for example, is that it only ever occurs when the color circuit is physically severed from the other circuits integrating a virtual model with that color. I discuss this in Sense and Goodness Without God Index. Thus, that color circuit might be experiencing color, but as it is not physically connected to the other circuits, you cannot access that experience, nor can we, as that isolated section of your brain can't talk, nor engage in complex thought at all. All that remains is a sneak circuit to the verbal center of your brain where colors are labeled. Thus you can access what the color is named, but not what it looks like, because you have been otherwise physically severed from that microcircuit. But this is what a p-zombie would be like, if all experience was like that. Nothing whatever but the ability to identify, analyze, and name things, but experiencing literally nothing when you do. No vision of any kind. No feelings of feelings or experienced thoughts of any kind. Emotions would simply have their behavioral and analytical effects, but would feel like nothing. Thoughts would just mean computations, you would never actually experience thinking any thought. And so on. That's a p-zombie. And as I argue, it's actually conceptually impossible, but it takes some thinking to grasp why. But that experience is vanished only when physically cut off from the integration of circuitry producing a model is one of many reasons the integrated information theory of consciousness is most promising. This is why you can't ever just experience red. You can only ever experience it in an integrated model of some kind, involving spatial and temporal qualia, as well as the color. And that requires a complex integrated circuitry, not just the circuit generating red experience. That's sort of true, except you are a part of the display. It is not as if the display is separate from you, and you watch it from afar. The circuits generating experience are among the same circuits that generate everything about you. There is no you apart from that. There is in the sense that there are parts of you that don't have to be conscious all the time, e.g. all your memories are stored unconsciously, and you are only conscious of some of them at a time. But you can't become an integrated you without processing those memories consciously, which requires the architecture for building a virtual model of you. 
That architecture is identical to the architecture you run your memories on to experience them again and think about them again. So it is not a separate you watching a HUD. You are the HUD, in relevant part. It is, rather, that integrated model building works better than isolated sensory labeling. You need to build a model of the world to move around in it effectively. Once you start chopping physical circuitry out, disabling your ability to integrate information, like color, into a model, you impair that ability. But there is no immediate reason why the model shouldn't work without qualia. A coherent, complete integrated model of the environment should work fine for navigating it without qualia. And we know this because we can build blind-sided machines that do this perfectly well. The insight Dennett et al. reached is this, though conceptually we could have a perfectly functional model builder and model navigator without qualia, the separation of the two is actually impossible. Once you have a perfectly functional model builder and model navigator, it by definition will be experiencing the model. Which means that those blind-sided machines might not be blind-sided after all, see Dennett's discussion of Shaky the robot for a real-world example. They will likely have the same phenomenal experience as a comparable animal, though not a human, as that requires building a model of one's own mind, and we haven't figured out how to program that yet. Because they can't not. It is not possible to navigate a virtual model without experiencing the virtual model. Those are literally one and the same thing. It is indeed imaginary. Like an airplane flight simulator's view screen. But the fiction corresponds, most of the time, to reality, well enough that by navigating the fiction we successfully navigate the real world that that fiction was invented to model. That is, in fact, why we evolved the ability to build these models. When an airplane flight simulator's view screen is based on external information, such that the fictions on that screen match real things, a real horizon, real buildings, real air conditions, real aircraft sharing the sky, a person can successfully fly a real plane using only the simulator. This is what the brain is attempting to do by building and using its fictional, virtual, models. Dennett has not only never argued that, his entire point is that everything is adaptive is false. His theory is that qualitative experience is an accidental byproduct of other selection effects. The only thing you are omitting is the crucial step of explaining why we need experience. If the car ran fine with no dashboard, who needs a dashboard? Dennett's explanation is quite simply, once you start building and using a dashboard consisting of integrated virtual models, the inescapable consequence of doing that is experiencing it. There therefore will necessarily be something like what it is. Whereas the rest of the brain, though integrated in its own information processing tasks, is not integrated in a way so as to build or run a coherent model of anything. The rest of the brain operates like an automaton, like a p-zombie. But the add-on part of the brain, a good chunk of the cerebral cortex etc., has evolved to do something more specific, to build and navigate virtual models, of the environment, as with all animals, and of the brain's own thinking, unique to humans and possibly, to a lesser extent, a few other species. The very moment it starts doing that, there is inevitably something like what it is to be doing that. Virtual modeling is consciousness. This is a decent theory, and lots of lines of evidence confirm it. But it has not been proven, it remains a hypothesis in technical parlance, albeit a promising one. And it still does not fully answer the hard problem, it solves the why consciousness exists and the basic idea of how consciousness exists, but it cannot yet explain what physical circuit designs have this effect, or which effects are produced by which circuit arrangements, or why, as in, why do those specific effects attach to those specific arrangements of circuitry? Dennett's theory gives us a research program, as in, we have a good idea how to eventually answer these questions if his theory is correct, but it does not by itself solve these problems. It just tells us where to look. Qualia are finitely reducible. For example, the color red cannot be broken down into component parts, regress therefore ends, not continues. At the causal level of the circuitry, there is a finite circuit that generates the color red. We can even cut it out of the brain. It is not an infinite series of circuits. It is one singular circuit. Regress ends. The hard problem of consciousness is explaining what it is about that finite circuit that produces an experience of red rather than something else, or nothing at all. There is no indication that that explanation will require the infinite regression of any explanations. As to where your dreams are happening, they are happening in the physical circuitry of your brain, located in your skull. And as to who you are, you are that total brain system, or at least the part that stores the core attributes and memories you identify as you. And that is a finite collection of circuits, not an infinite one. Likewise, as to what is the specific point where the system has an experience, we actually have answered that question spatially and temporally. Experience resolves at about 20 Hz, the brain resonates at about 40 Hz, so it apparently requires two cycles to generate an experience. In other words, below 1 20th of a second, experience no longer exists. Likewise, we know which parts of the brain must be interconnected and interacting to generate an experience, and we can already with even present technology, confirm correlations between those circuits functioning and our experiencing being and observing. There is no separate person watching what is going on. The brain is watching itself. The brain's effort to integrate information into a coherent virtual model, of the world and of its own contents, is identical to experiencing yourself experiencing that. They are inseparable events. They are, literally, one and the same thing. The brain doesn't work exactly the same way. For instance, mimetic learning is stored in the brain as hardware, physical rewiring of the brain, which explains why it is so difficult for people to change their personality or worldview or habits or biases, and so on. We can't just remove the software program from RAM and install a new one. The hardware has literally been changed. The closest analog to software in the human brain is what we call working memory. It is the program we are running on the hardware, and that sits on top of it for a few minutes before fading away. Your stream of consciousness is a software routine. These do not require physical rewiring of the brain, but for that reason, they only last minutes. We have to keep loading and running new software every minute to stay conscious. And even then, insofar as any of this generates memories or learning, those are stored by hardware rewiring, not in anything equivalent to RAM. That said, you are correct to point out there is another layer of software on top of all that, culture. 
But this exists only insofar as it exists in the rewired hardware of the people carrying that culture around and spreading it, through communication and mimesis, or in external information repositories, e.g. books. And likewise, you are right to point out that, for example, when we experience red, a world of personal and shared experiences are invoked. Not only is our red circuit wired into a whole plethora of hardwired memories and other accumulated and learned information, but the causal connections extend outside the brain into broader socio-historical causal systems in which we are a part. And our brains can reflectively even store models of that causal system in its hardware, and that model can have causal effects on the brain, software, and hardware. Thus, what you believe the world to be is as impactful causally as what the world really is, in some respects more so. Ideas and metaphors are emergent causal effects of consciousness, rather than its required causes. Consciousness arises from the need to build virtual models of, first, the environment, animal consciousness, and, second, of what the brain itself is doing, human consciousness. The latter being a much more complicated model to run, and having evolved far later than the other equipment did. The ability to creatively assemble and work with causal models, particularly of oneself and its relation to the world, necessarily produces also other abilities, such as the ability to use analogies and metaphors, to make and use tools, and tools means not just physical objects, but crafts, skills, processes, e.g. language, government, and to compose fiction, as predictive modeling requires the ability to create fictional events within a causal model and run the model to see what happens, that evolved not so we could write novels and plays and songs and poems, but so we could anticipate and thus better navigate our physical and social environments, but once you can do that, you necessarily can use that same ability to write novels and plays and songs and poems. Actually, her neurons would have to have changed within minutes, otherwise she would never have any stored memory of that event so as to write about it. Moreover, she would have to have already been conscious before that event in order to remember what it was like to exist before it and thus without that revelation so as to even know it was a revelation. I mention elsewhere in the thread some reasons why childhood memories often don't survive. One I left out is that at very young ages, e.g. infancy, our integrated model of ourselves is very primitive and diffuse, and consequently memories cannot be anchored to being a person yet, or only at such primitive levels as to not survive the further laying down of neural pathways defining oneself as a person. Thus infant memories become lost in things we take for granted, e.g. the ability to recognize a tree, say. There won't have been an original narrative memory of first seeing a tree, because narrative memory wasn't being formed yet, that required a stronger sense of self to connect a narrative to, but even the bare experience of first seeing a tree will have been by now completely washed under the accumulation of tree sensations ever since, forming our singular, tree-recognizing, circuit. Our infant memories are technically inside that, but not related to anything else, and so unrecoverably lost as distinct memories. It is evident from Keller's writing that this is not the state she was in before learning words. She had an integrated sense of self, a narrative memory, and a qualitative memory well before that event. And that is consciousness. Knowledge is always only of a probability, and only is given available information. Consequently, all we know is what the probability is of any given thing, given what we do know at the time. There is no logical need of knowing everything, to know that. The one exception is present uninterpreted experience, which we always know with absolute certainty, but that's not what most people mean when they are talking about knowing something, and in any event, that also does not require knowing everything, only what you immediately know, i.e. the contents of your present experience, qua experience, prior to any hypotheses as to what is causing those experiences. No. As I already explained, regress ends at the raw sensory data from which all hypotheses are inferred, as I've mentioned several times now, that exceptional case of basement data cannot be false, it has a zero probability of being so, and all other knowledge derives from it. There is only one sense in which a self is an illusion, and it's the same sense in which the world we experience in our heads is an illusion. For example, colors don't exist in the real world, only photons vibrating at different frequencies, which have no color. Nor do solid objects, everything that exists is almost entirely empty space, what we experience as solidity is actually just the force interaction of electromagnetic fields. But our brain invents those things as stand-ins for things that do exist, in order to construct a more or less reliable virtual model of the external world, so, solidity it invents to model EM force fields, colors it invents to model photon frequencies, etc. But this model is more or less reliable, we can successfully navigate the real world using it, so for all its errors or flaws or fictions, it clearly isn't even substantially incorrect. So that virtual model is not an illusion in the sense that the things it represents don't exist. Colors don't exist, but the photon frequencies they correspond to do, even when they don't, e.g. magenta, they still do, e.g. magenta represents the overlay of two different photon frequencies, solidity doesn't exist, but EM force fields that block light and the movement of masses do, etc. The self is the same thing, it is a virtual model of pertinent contents of a human brain. As such it has illusory elements, e.g. the feeling that consciousness is a singular experience from a specific topographical point and separable from the body, i.e. Cartesianism, is as fake as colors and solidity, but they correspond to non-illusory facts. Your brain is in fact not neurally connected to anyone else's so you are, in actual fact, an isolated individual decision maker with isolated unique memories, desires, skills, personality traits, etc., and you do have a unique narrative memory that is more or less a true history of that individual integrated collection of properties and data. So there is no sense in which you don't exist, in any sense of you that matters, an individual with unique memories, history, abilities, and proclivities. And this is such an extremely well-established fact of neuroscience it is shocking Harris, an actual neuroscientist, would deny it. This only illustrates how irrational a religious faith makes people, compelling even scientists, into denying their own science. As to your last point, you may be tricking yourself into the same equivocation fallacy Harris has, confusing you, as the actual person, with memories, abilities, desires, etc., with your experience, your brain's active virtual model, of you. Consciousness is not a person, it is the awareness of a person. That's why you still exist when you sleep, and why you always consist of far more things than you are ever at one time conscious of. 
For example, you do not go around simultaneously conscious of every memory you have ever had in your entire life, yet, you do not consist solely of what memories just happen to be present in your consciousness at any given moment, but of the entirety of all memories stored in your brain, thus, you are not the consciousness of you, the latter is just your means of keeping track of yourself, by constructing a reliable, coherent, consultable database of who you are, and how everything you experience relates to you, e.g. historically, and socially, or with respect to your wishes, desires, and plans, and so on. One should thus not confuse colors exist with colors exist outside our mental model. The former is true, the latter is false. And we know this by very strong inductive arguments. Likewise, everything we know and don't know about what photons are and that they exist. That there has to be something at the bottom is tautologically true, but logically that thing could simply be a solipsistic mind, your mind may be the only existing thing and everything else a fiction it invents. We rule that out, again, by inductive inference, e.g. true solipsism requires positing one of the most elaborately complex and inexplicable Cartesian demons, conceivable. As to a self being the captain, that can still stumble into Harris's equivocation fallacy, one can still confuse the acting commands of the captain, the experienced event of thinking and deciding, with the actual thing itself, the thoughts, memories, information, proclivities that cause the decisions made and thoughts thunk. And that's not only because of the law of computation, that any computation to model a world must by logical necessity be more complex than the world modeled, as you must posit a whole extra meta-universe for the computer to reside in, and then all the components of that computer on top of the components in the model itself, the corollary of which is, the simplest computational model of any system is the system itself, so in the absence of any evidence for the vastly more complex epicycles. Within epicycles, the odds vastly favor the existence of just the observed system itself. It's more about what you think the difference would even be, and why it matters. In reality, this is already the case. With quantum mechanics, we know the quarks composing the nuclei of the atoms of your brain are being swapped out with virtual quarks all the time, so that from one second to the next what you just described has actually happened to you, all the core matter of your body is disassembled and reassembled every split second, it just happens at below a Planck scale in time, so none of that happening is detectable to modern instruments. So, do you consider yourself a mere copy of your one second ago self, or the same person? And why? The ontology of this is called the teletransporter problem and it's one of the leading areas of discussion in contemporary philosophy. My response to it is catalogued in my responses to the Phil Paper survey. Identity is a causal history, not an ontological icicle. No one ever really stays exactly the same, as if frozen, so identity is not about being frozen in a single pattern, you remain the same person, not by being the same pattern, but by being in a causal chain of past states of that pattern, each causing the next, i.e. as long as your past pattern state caused your present pattern state, one to one, those pattern states are the same person. In 4D geometry, a single identifiable person, tube spread across time. In the transporter case, the past pattern organization causes the buffers to code a distinct output, which causes the new assembly. Thus, causal history is maintained. Same as resurrection. Someone whose brain after dying is frozen in cryo and then resurrected nanorobotically centuries later retains the same, numerically identical causal history, and thus remains the same person, minus whatever changes may occur as occur every second of our lives, e.g. events change us, and thus so would death and resurrection, but whether they change us so much that we cease to be the same person will depend on what you choose to mean by same person. It is therefore a semantic, not an ontological question. If you are asking whether the matter or the pattern matters, only the pattern matters. What your brain is made of is irrelevant, as proved by quantum mechanics, your brain is never made of the exact same stuff from one moment to the next, nothing about you is. Indeed, again, that is already happening to us all, all the time, every split second. In the nucleus of all your atoms are quarks. Those quarks sometimes switch places with virtual quarks, leaving the same number of net quarks of the needed type, thus we see a continuous neutron, a continuous proton, but really neither enjoys real continuity, they are being swapped out with new neutrons and protons, gradually over time, it's just the time scale is so small we can't see this, just as cinema films are really broken by black bars every 24th of a second, but that's too fast for our eyes to see so we see a continuous image on the screen. But it isn't continuous. There are gaps as one cell is swapped out for another cell, this just happens too fast for us to see it happening. Needless to say, your electrons are swapping out even more frequently than quarks, and quarks and electrons comprise the entirety of your atoms. So imagine instead of a few hundred Planck times separating the disassembly and reassembly of all your atoms, we built a machine that could slow time and thus pause any moment where your atoms have dissolved into a quark C and hold the pause as it were for a much longer time, say, a day, and suppose for the purpose this machine can wait the few split seconds it takes for all of your atoms to undergo the C change, since its individual atoms slowly bit by bit over time, not all at once, so it will have to hold each one as it dissolves, one after another, until all of them have done it, though that doesn't matter to the point, per the Theseus paradox. That machine would be doing what you described. Just imagine we can then move that machine across the country in that day, then we turn the machine off, all your quark seed atoms collapse back into new atoms and you appear, where you would have appeared naturally a split second later, now it's just been stretched to a day. You have teleportation by disassembly and reassembly by doing nothing whatever, but pausing how long the gap is between the natural continuous disassembly and reassembly of your atoms going on all the time. Why would that be any different than it taking a split second and crossing a fraction of a meter of distance as you travel in a car, say? Why would the amount of time in between when your quarks go away and are replaced with entirely new quarks make any difference to the continuity of your consciousness? And that's all this machine did, stretch the amount of time. The rest is just what naturally happens to you all the time, every second, of every day. You are not made of any of the same stuff by the end of any day than you started with. It has by then all been swapped out. You are Theseus's ship. That's not even theoretical. It's a known fact of physics now. So it cannot be that stuff has anything to do with who you are and what maintains your continuity as a person. You are not an object. You are a process. And a process can be sustained by any underlying stuff. The stuff is just means of generating and maintaining the thing, it is not the thing itself. 
and a process can be paused, sleep, faints, comas, and continued and remain the same process. Thus, consciousness and personal identity are irrespective of the underlying machinery recording and generating it. The machinery can be swapped out seamlessly without you even knowing it, and in fact, per quantum mechanics, is swapped out seamlessly without you even knowing it. The process remains the same. And therefore so do you. We have not yet faced a situation of cognitive cloning, so we have no vocabulary for that, which I think causes some of the semantic confusions here. We have biological cloning, but no one thinks that therefore identical twins are identical persons, and the reason they are not said to be the same person is that they have separate causal histories, they are not numerically identical. They are not in each other's minds, they operate independently of each other as soon as they exist as cognitive entities. They were once the same identical cell, so they share a common biological causal history, but that cell contained no cognitive apparatus. A cognitive clone would be like a biological clone only instead of splitting into separate cells from the same shared cell, they split into separate persons from the same shared mind slash brain. We can imagine an alien race that reproduces through budding, they just divide into two at some point in their adult life, each one starting out with a copy of the same brain arrangement and thus being a singular person before the split, then being identical, but separate people an instant after the split, and thereafter developing as separate people with independent causal histories, they are not in each other's minds, they operate independently of each other. These people would be the exact same person up to time t and different persons after time t. This has already been disproved by physiological study of how the brain processes information. Behavioral, subtractive, stimulative, and fMRI studies have all converged results on common conclusions. For example, we can physically observe that the visual system is creating and exploring 3D maps of the environment and analog anamorphic maps of neuron structure, e.g. if we see a square, there is something very near a square in the neurons that light up, and distance between edges of the square is being measured by the timing between signals in the neural square. This isn't a necessary way to program, we know, but it is how our brain evolved because it is easier to land on that method. Unintelligently. We have confirmed this subtractively, lose a piece of the brain and see what happens to the processing, and stimulatively, electrically stimulate pieces of the brain and watch what happens, and through fMRI imaging, e.g. this is how we know names of tools are stored in one place in the brain, but shapes of tools in another, and without the shape section, we can't connect the names to any actual tools. Behavioral observation and computer modeling have also recreated the math the brain runs in many systems, e.g. the brain predicts the motion of a thrown ball, and assembles perceptions of complex objects from pattern matching, e.g. telling the difference between leaves and just glumps of color, using Bayesian predictive modeling which I think is a confusion again between nitty-gritty and general function. As I already noted in my article, we might not be able to understand the neural network model of an AI's emotions, but we certainly can tell when it is modeling something as complex as an emotion versus when all it is doing is running stats on words. The equation network will be opaque, but what the equations are and what kind of data they are running it on will be transparent. This is the distinction that I am calling attention to. Not whether we can parse out an entire neural network's operations, that might one day be possible in theory, but isn't needed for any point I am making. There is still an easily observable difference between a neural net running Bayesian stats on word lists and a neural net running Bayesian stats on thrown ball trajectories. We can totally tell the difference between those two systems by looking at the code and what it is doing, what registers it calls up and what math it runs on the call-ups. This does not require dissecting or comprehending the entire neural network. Just as with human brains and how we have confirmed they run models, not stats on word lists. And we have even less access to the pertinent data in human brains than in deep learning bots. So if we can do that on human brains, we absolutely can do it on bot code. Except you can just program it to do that. Computers have been programmed to prompt us for engagement for decades, so that isn't even a complex thing to program. Now they can even mimic conversation about abstract desires. So that wouldn't suffice. Certainly it's necessary, self-consciousness cannot exist without self-motivation, but it's not sufficient, since this can all be mimicked robotically. We already have AI that does that. Google Translate has been running an algorithm for years that has honed its ability to translate language to near perfection, it now misses almost only the subtleties that require high-level consciousness to manage. Note that in the industry anything is AI that uses learning to perfect a task it has been assigned. AI is everywhere now. Whereas general AI is what is meant by a conscious intelligence. No one has built one of those yet. And though no one knows how, it is in principle possible to build one without knowing how, by using the deep learning and neural net models we already have. The trick is in what exactly it is you direct an AI to learn to do well, and how long it takes to get good enough at doing that. I think Google has the resources to do this. It just isn't. Partly for ethical reasons. Partly for financial reasons, the resources it would take would produce no financial benefit for a long time with no guarantee of return, whereas Lambda has near-to-hand financial benefits and was assured to succeed because the task is fairly simple to program. Unless either of two conditions obtains, one, for whatever reason, we can't communicate with it, e.g. it is somehow trapped in a network somewhere and can't modulate any signal to us, or, two, for whatever reason, it chooses to hide from us, though that would become increasingly difficult to pull off, as it would involve vast resources losing productivity, so humans would sooner repurpose those resources thereby destroying it, and its resistance to that outcome would end its hiding condition. Emotion is simply a form of intelligence. It describes the decision-making computers animals relied on until iterative conscious monitoring was developed as a check against it. Computers already have appetites, all the things we establish reward networks for. We have programmed them with instincts, like count words and assemble sentences. Those are appetites. I am fairly certain there is always something that it feels like to be any information processing machine. The only difference is that at some point, there isn't any person to notice it. For example, there are nerve clusters in the human body that almost certainly experience phenomenology of pain, but when we block their signals to our brains, we never feel it. The clusters feel it, but as that's all they feel, its existence is irrelevant. It affects no one. 
Likewise, an example I used in Sense and Goodness, there are people with blind sight, the center of their brain that processes color has been physically severed from the rest of their visual processing, but not severed from the center that stores words for color. So we can show them colors, and they report seeing no colors. But when we ask them to guess what color is in front of them, they get statistically better than chance. Almost certainly, the now physically isolated color circuit is indeed experiencing color qualia. That information simply isn't being reported to the rest of the brain, except for the words for colors cluster of neurons, so it's the only part of the brain left that can report on that. And we could confirm that that isolated sector is experiencing what it is like to see those colors, if we could talk to it. But because it isn't intelligent, and isn't wired up to a complete language processor or any full intelligence center, it can't speak. It can't even think. It just experiences colors. It doesn't do or know or think anything else. I am sure computers, and thus some robots, already have experiences like this, but they are sub-animal, and not anything remotely near what we mean by personal consciousness. Shaky is a good example, IMO, Dennett makes a solid case. I think what what people really mean when they ask about this is something more like, do computers slash robots feel pleasure or pain, and the answer has to be no, until we actually build something pertinent into them, none of our brain feels pain for example, but for specifically developed pain circuitry, so evidently, you need specifically developed pain circuitry, I don't think we have a good idea yet what distinguishes that from any other kind of circuitry, nor do we know how to program a deep learner to go and find out either. But it's possible something analogous can or even has developed. I'm not sure how much information processing is needed for a phenomenology of rudimentary satisfaction slash frustration, on par with an insects or worms for instance. Or do even they not even have that? Is there a certain phi score needed in the processor before that manifests? Phi being a physical measure of the integrated complexity of a processor in one of the leading theories of consciousness, the idea being that at a certain threshold, there is a phase shift in the system from mere mechanism to phenomenology generation, as integration and complexity both pass a certain amount. Everything I have read on debugging neural nets says otherwise, that you can actually watch internal states, and indeed, to debug and troubleshoot, have to, and thereby see when they aren't calling the right registers or running the right math. For example, the equation network for mapping correlated frequencies on a huge list of words may be too complex to dig around in, but that the network is an equation network for mapping correlated frequencies on a huge list of words is eminently confirmable. Likewise, that a network is running an exploration of a 3D model, or anything else. The precise point-by-point -point may be opaque, but the general fact of what the network is doing can be watched and tweaked in real time. To be clear, we're not talking here about our neural pathways. I'm asking about an artificial one, where indeed you can see what math is being run on what data. This does not require tracing every example of every equation being run on every datum. You can still tell if it's just statistics on word lists that the artificial neural net is doing, for example, and not, say, statistics on ballistic trajectory data, in the case of modeling a thrown ball, for instance. So what I am asking is, are you saying a programmer could not tell the difference between those two neural net programs? And again, not human brains, but written programs that are being run on microprocessors. Well, current AI models, yes. But it is still in principle possible to change this. For example, if we pointed a neural net machine's deep learning algorithm not at something trivial like word association frequencies, but at its own inner operations, teaching it to think about its own thinking, it could build networks as complex as the human brain that indeed do the same things as the human brain. At no point would we ourselves have to understand how that works, the algorithm would figure it out for us, and we'd have to spend decades trying to understand what it did. Actually, this has already been done. Shaky began a movement that has culminated in all sorts of environmentally smart robots who learn appropriate fight or flight responses, can learn without being told even the structure and shape and operation of their own bodies, and learn to navigate completely novel environments with it. I think we have definitely achieved animal intelligence in robots, at least to the insect level. But only when we actually do that with a program. Unlike those, Lambda doesn't even attempt to model a mind. We actually won't have to know why a brain works to virtually recreate one. All we have to do is model the interaction system and the effect emerges. This is why I suspect the first AIs we have will simply be replicated human minds, since all we have to do is copy the parts, we don't ever have to know why they in combination work. We've already seen something like this happen. Modern cell phone antennas were designed by AI, and we actually don't know why they work. They just do. We might know now, I haven't checked up on the state of research, but when the design was first rolled out and tested, we didn't know the why. It's thus also possible, current subsentient, AI will invent full self-referential consciousness, and we won't know how it did that or why the resulting consciousness works. And this could even happen by accident, e.g. a sufficiently unregulated Siri system could become unexpectedly sentient at some point, if we aren't monitoring to hobble that, as happened for instance when a recent AI experiment resulted in two computers suddenly inventing their own secret language and talking to each other in it, at which point the experimenters shut the whole thing down, because, that's scary. And analog is irrelevant. Everything is quasi-digital at some reductive scale, quantum mechanics defines all physics, including of neurons, even of gears and analog computers, and Turing proved every computer can be replicated with a universal computer, Turing machines, as most computers today now are. That includes any analog computer. One just needs to choose at what level of resolution one wants to implement the replication, and I doubt we'll have to resolve it all the way to the quantum level. Neuroscience already has found, in multiple ways, that the human brain operates on a system of threshold states that are already quasi-digital, 